Well, hello, everybody. Hopefully your week's going well. You know what starts a week off really well? <laughs> Fucking coffee. That's right. Go to blackriflecoffee.com. I personally just type that into my search browser. I'm not going to judge you depending on which browser you use. But the first thing I see is the pumpkin spice flavored coffee. The return of the headless horseman roast. I mean, seriously, what other information do you need to stop fucking about? If you like coffee, it's an amazing roast. It's obviously it's fall based, which I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, Evan, if you're listening to this, go ahead and turn it off at the Black Rifle Coffee Shop in Kalispell. We are going to be offering pumpkin cream cold brews year round. Maybe we'll have to change the name to uh, get past the brand standards. I don't even know, but we're going to make it happen. Let's say you don't like that. That's fine. You know, you're just not a fan of living life to its fullest and you hate yourself. That's cool. I mean, Black Rifle Coffee has a bunch of other roasts you could choose from because right underneath the advertisement for the Headless Horseman Roast, there is a little tab that says shop all coffee from light to extra dark. So you can do whatever you want to as far as that goes. And then there's t-shirts and there's things you can use to make coffee, carry coffee in, drink coffee out of, shirts, hats. I mean, damn, they got just about everything. So go to blackriflecoffee.com and spend your hard-earned money. That's what I do. And uh, yeah, let's move on. How about we talk about my guest today? Episode number 252, repeat guest, Mr. Greg Anderson. I first met Greg, or was, well, I first met him the first time he came on the podcast, but I was introduced to him. He made a very viral video in the, probably safe to say the peak of the, uh, maybe not even the peak, it was earlier on in the pandemic, but he was a Port Authority or Port of Seattle police officer. And he made a video in his vehicle, and the video speaks for itself. You can just go to uh, Google or YouTube and put in, you know, Greg Anderson, police officer, and it's going to come up. You'll see him. He's sitting there with a baseball hat on backwards in his vehicle. And the content of that vehicle had him placed on administrative leave. It was brought to my uh, attention, sent by many people. He ended up coming out, and he's become an awesome friend. So couldn't be happier to have him back on. He does well, – he's no longer a police officer, spoiler alert, if you haven't listened to any of our other episodes. But – uh, you know, he has a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym himself uh, in Washington. He There's a CrossFit gym associated with that as well. He's doing firearms and jiu-jitsu training. Uh, he's offering courses. I know that Mike Glover is either out there this upcoming weekend or is out there right now as I'm uh, talking about this because it's Sunday. I'm getting ready to be the Monday that this launches. Uh, so he's got that going on to him. He's got a podcast, Endless Endeavor, fantastic podcast. What else does he have going on? A ton of shit. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Black Melt under the uh, check mat lineage. And, you know, instead of me talking about Greg, how about we let Greg talk about himself? So I'm going to shut the fuck up and get into episode number 252 with Greg Anderson. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Are we recording, Michael? See, this is why I don't give him a microphone, because he would, like, sass me back. Interject shit that you don't want and don't need. <sighs> Full disclosure, I just haven't had time to drill the hole in the desk, and then he'll get one. There we go. Whether or not I turn it on, though, is a different story. And it then, might be just, like, a comfort microphone. And then he can start looking stuff up for you? Yeah, because I have been known to talk about things that I don't know about at all. And is, proven. Isn't that what we do on podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> and then have people reach out and go, hey, uh... Yeah, that thing you were saying is the completely the opposite. I'm like, uh, okay, yeah, that's why I generally will preface with, I don't, I'm not an expert at fill in the blank. Dude, when you fucking talk for hours on end, there's gonna be bits and pieces that everything might not be exactly as it is, and people like jump at every opportunity to jump into your inbox and be like, actually, you said this and it's that. Like, yeah, can you imagine wasting your time to go tell someone that they misspoke, like? <laughs> No, and I used to, if I'm being honest, I used to engage a lot more in the comment section, and I would ignore all the positive, and I would see the negative one, and that shit would eat away at me. Isn't that weird? So I would I would think for fucking days and hours about a sassy response that they didn't even probably fucking take the time to read, because they're like hitting it off, and then half of them are ghost account anyways. I swear to God, people create accounts 
to sure. post, and then they probably forget how to log back in anyway, so they can't even see your response. Yeah, no profile picture, <laughs> None. And zero followers, yeah. and they're talking shit to everybody. To everybody. But then I realized, how fucked up does their life have to be for them to be doing that? Do you know anybody who is fulfilled, successful, doing what they want to do that wastes any fucking time doing that? No, and the, the more I go down the path of creating my dream, the more I realize I need to get as far away from that shit as possible. Let's not take this spiritual, all right? Like we're, <laughs> Dude, we're just gonna fucking. I'm becoming die. spiritual. You're gonna hear about it. Like your it or post not. today, I'm, because I drink water, I'm connected to the earth, bro. I'm it's like fuck. I'm telling you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, bro. You get up every morning. I drink 32 ounces of water and I go walk outside. I and feel that like doesn't that's sound a like lot a, of water. It doesn't sound like a big deal. It doesn't sound like something hard to do. Yeah. But and for people that don't know what we're fucking talking about i just completed 75 hard which i actually don't know much about it i was planning on just asking you what you were what it was and if you've heard of a program called 76 Easy. hard sometimes <laughs> so, so, occasionally so, difficult 76 medium <laughs> i mean we are we're ideating right here we yeah, can yeah. have a business <laughs> so yeah the whole deal is 75 hard it's not a fitness program it's a program to instill habits good habits into your life and, uh, you know, a lot of programs are 30 days or a month or whatever, you know, but doing it for two and a half months, it really starts to become normal. And for two and a half months, I woke up early at sunrise, went outside and walked or ran and drank water and just got my body moving. And bro, I mean, I've been a fucking athlete my whole life. It's getting up and working out is not, a. Uh, uh, like an abstract idea. It's but ingrained. Just making it a habit though, because it's a habit when we were in the military, but dude, it's easy to get lazy when you're when you're your own boss. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's a real thing. Probably the easiest thing to do actually. And so like, uh, and it wasn't even my idea, it was uh, my boy Levi, who is, he's 18 years old, and he's not my biological son, but I've had like a massive influence in his life, and was a father figure, and he goes, hey, I wanna do 75 hard. Do you wanna do it with me? And I was just sitting in, in the kitchen. I'm like, yeah, okay. I can't say no to that. You know, yeah. a young kid that wants to try something to instill discipline. So I was like, fuck it, let's do it. And bro, it's the best thing that I've done, man. So does the program itself lay out the boundaries for you? Because I know you made some dietary restrictions. Yeah, yeah. Is that part of it or did you choose to do that? There's an exercise so, regimen. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually, it's a pretty simple concept. Do you know who, do you know who Andy Frisella is? No, I was going to ask you that too because I, I had seen you posting that it was his program and okay, I, Andy, I have heard of him. I don't know who Andy Frisella is. Andy is the, he created First Form, okay. which is a supplement company. But they're a lot bigger than a supplement company. They're like a movement, a culture movement. And they're a company based out of St. Louis, Missouri. I've been down there. I've met him and his brother and all the people down there. Good fucking people. And he came up with this program because, you know, he that company blew up. He became a multimillionaire and he was balling, but he got fat and lazy. And he's like, okay, I'm winning on some aspects of life, but I'm fucking failing on others. So how do I dial it in? And he came up with this idea and called it 75 Hard. And it's, it's basically, here, I'll look it up. Actually, no, I can't because I already completed it, so now my app doesn't work. Um, it's two workouts a day that are 45 minutes. One of, them, of your choice? Of your choice. One of them has to be outside. Okay. It's drinking a gallon of water a day. It's reading 10 pages a day. It's not drinking no alcohol and following a diet that you set for yourself with zero cheat meals. And so that's it. The parameters are pretty wide open for you to kind of tailor it to what you need but the reason is because he's like hey if a bodybuilder wants to do this and a, and a marathoner wants to do this i can't set workout routines i can't set yeah. i can't set caloric intake restrictions and shit like that like you set what needs to work for you but then there's zero deviation once you set it and so for me dude i'm a fucking like sometimes less is more like it's easier for me and i think that's common for a lot of guys like us like the concept it was simple implementation can be kind of difficult. So instead of like counting calories or weighing my food or on Sunday night putting 40 Tupperwares together with meals, I was, I can't deal with that. I, fa <laughs> I fail with that shit, bro. I said, you know what? I'm just going to eat steak, eggs, and apples. How'd you pick those? Just, I mean, I've been, do you know who Sean Baker is? He's the carnivore. He did Ro Rogan's show. He's the I carnivore. So. Uh, he wrote the book, The Carnivore Diet. Okay. Um, he's actually one of my jujitsu students and he's a savage. What belt is he? He's a white belt. 
He's new to jujitsu. Fuck he, that dude up, <laughs> bro. He was, yeah, of course I do. But <laughs> but he was a professional rugby player in New Zealand for a long time. Oh, that's gonna be a problem. And he's six four two sixty. No, that's with abs. <clears throat> that's a huge problem. Big problem. Yeah. I don't care how much jujitsu you have. No, that's a and fucking so, uh, huge problem. Not only is he a fucking phenomenal athlete, but after I think he was in his thirties, he's like, rugby is not gonna. There's no longevity in rugby. So what should I do next? Went to medical school and became an orthopedic surgeon. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah I know, he's just one of those guys, right? Yeah. And uh, and he was a doctor for a long time. He's told me, he's like, no, I've done hundreds of knee replacements. He went to uh, Iraq and did a bunch of trauma. He worked like in a the, surgical rotation. Yeah, yeah, surgical rotation, dealing with guys that are getting blown up and shit. So he's had a lot of experience in that field. So being an athlete and someone in medicine, that's like, I want to hear what he has to say about how to make the human body work. And he's like, dude, we're finding the more, the more we look into it and the more studies we do, massive amounts of meat are showing to be the healthiest fucking diet. And I'm not going to sit here and give yeah. you all the details because I'm not qualified to do yeah, so. because we're monkeys. <laughs> yeah, but he's like, dude, they're doing all of these studies and finding that it's like, it's when you go on a hundred percent meat diet, it's alleviating all of these autoimmune diseases, all of these diseases that cause inflammation, diabetes, and it's crazy how much success they're having. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to give this a try. And I tried it before and with zero carbs training hard jujitsu, I just always felt a little off. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do carnivore, but I'm going to add a little bit of fruit in just for carbohydrates. So I was eating like two or three apples a day. On top of how'd you land on uh, apples? Because I fucking love them. Even after seventy five. Oh, bro! I just had an apple before I came here. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) as long as it's a Honeycrisp, Mm. don't give me a fucking Granny Smith or some bullshit like that. There are some fucked up apples. (laughs) There's there's plenty of fucked up apples. Which they can make apple sauce out of, and I probably still consume that. And the newest fucked up apple is the Cosmic Crisp. That's the new one. Have you heard of that? No. They're trying to make the Honeycrisp better. And sometimes just don't fuck with a good thing. How the fuck do you know so much about apples? Because, I mean, actually. <laughs> well, actually, since you've been eating them no, straight. No, no, no. For here's, seven- I went to an a, uh, apple grafting seminar and I uh, grafted a Recently? bunch Recently? No, this was like five years ago. And I grafted a bunch of my own apple trees and grew them from little saplings. And they're actually right next to my jiu-jitsu academy. And for five years, they grew and they were like. This was the first year they produced fruit, and then one of my black belts brought his dog over, and you know where this is going, and he chewed them all to the ground, and I was like, cool. <laughs> that dog's still alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, actually, I actually like that motherfucker, but. What kind of dog is it? Uh, it's like a, he got it at the pound, so it's kind of a mutt, but it's like a pit mix. Yeah. Because nobody wants pits that are at the pound. But I have had some of the best interactions with pit bulls. Bro, it's a cool fucking dog, for sure. I think it's more uh, indicative of how they are treated. Yeah, much probably much like human beings. Of course, you know? man. Yeah, pits get a bad uh, a bad rap for sure. But <laughs> currently, French bulldog is at the top of my list. Oh yeah, um, I don't have French bulldogs, but I have friends that do, and they're pretty amazing. I went from Malinois to Jack Russells, so we're, I'm a Jack Russell guy now. <sighs> God, you're into some kinky shit. <laughs> but anyway, seventy five hard. It's it's building the habit of doing those things for 75 days because bro i reading is good for you period yeah the most successful people in the world read tons of books everybody knows that but for whatever reason i would rather look at instagram instead of reading books it's almost like instagram is designed to to have that magnetizing (laughs) pull no i know right and it's like even though you know okay one rots my brain and one is gonna build a path to success and you'll pick mm, the rot. yeah i'll pick up my phone and start scrolling instagram if you put food in front of most humans to include myself and it's like healthy far less healthy but a little bit tastier i'm veering to the right most of the time yeah yeah and so it's like <laughs> rogan said it best he i you think he paraphrasing and it, maybe he wasn't even joe that said this <laughs> but our attention is the commodity now so the interface mm-hmm. that we have with the devices it's, it shouldn't be shocking to anybody that they're addictive because they're fucking designed to be. Bro, do you know what Netflix, they stated this. They said, do you know what our biggest competitor is? What do you think? Ne- ne- who do you TikTok. think? Sleep. Oh, those motherfuckers. Isn't that fucked up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. <laughs> not actually, if you to give me a hundred guesses, I wouldn't have said sleep. And bro, that's the truth. I mean, you'll sit up in bed and be like, oh man, this is good. I just want to see one more episode. And there's I've another. Never, I've never done that. Tell me oh, more. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> there's another avenue of, of society that's killing us is poor sleep patterns, you know? And so 
f- getting my life dialed in. And I mean, my life wasn't in fucking shambles to start with. Yeah. But we can all tighten things up. And dude, re- I burned through like five or six books already. I saw the post you made of the yeah. ones that you had read. And they're, and they're books that have actually taught me a lot of good shit, man. And so like I'm reading a book now called The Urban Monk. And it's just talking about how like we live in these concrete jungles and humanity is getting detached from the way that we've lived for thousands of years. And that's actually causing a lot of the fucking issues that we're having now and trying to bring yourself back to that and stay grounded. I'm going to send you a book just because I know you and your personality and you will go into fucking orbit. It's called the real Anthony Fauci. (laughs) Bro, (laughs) you will be texting me like you motherfucker. (laughs) I mean, fuck, dude. Let's just say well, the, the book was written. You can tell, as with a lot of books in that sphere, like, okay, this person is viewing it from this angle and and is talking about this from this angle. Having, you know, following you on social media and being aware of who your, I, uh, who your I stance, am. My on, stance things, on things. I'm going to send you this book just so your head explodes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll, we can go down those rabbit holes too, man. It might not enrich your life. It might, you might be in fucking, you, I might turn you into a goddamn comment section. <laughs> fucking second battalion, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to say congratulations on getting married. Yeah, man. It's, That's, uh, how's, how's that, man? Well, I mean, it was like nine days in. So, so, so you don't really know yet. I actually, I kind of, you <laughs> yeah. know, it's so second time around. And the biggest thing is, is I have a better understanding of who I am. Yeah. I'm as in my fucking early twenties. A fucking kid. I legitimately look back at pictures and I, I'm like, what the, not what, we, not what were you thinking like in, in a horrible way? But also, what were you thinking in a horrible way? And I'm saying that about myself, not my ex. It's just, I didn't know who the fuck I was. Yeah. I was at a super transformational time in my life. It was right after 9-11. Or actually, no, I take that back. We got married in February 2001. Okay. So married, pre-9-11 deployment, come back, 9-11, screen immediately for the East Coast Command. Like the fucking rubber hitting the road, you know, like dropping a car off the back of a semi 500 miles an hour kids in the mix deployment cycle in the mix and fuck man i mean i turned 45 in october i'm just i'm a different person i have a better understanding of myself what i want who i want to be and i i found somebody who is just fucking amazing yeah you know it's it's i can already it's just completely different and it's been that way you know since the first time we went out and got coffee you yeah know? Well, as soon as I saw the pictures on Instagram, I grounded my seven-year-old daughter because she, one of her chores is getting the mail. Yep. So I'm assuming she lost the wedding invitation. No, we can't invite conspiracy theorists. <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, my my first wedding occurred at a Justice of the Peace, and it was super tiny because I was getting ready to go on deployment. And for those of you in the military, your pay changes when you get married. I'm not saying you should get married for that reason, even yeah, though there is a incent- fleet of it, people that do. It incentivizes. It does. Your BAH goes up, which is what a basic ho- or BHA, basic housing allowance. So it's like right before deployment, we're like, we knew we were going to get married. Like, well, let's, what the fuck are we waiting for? And like, then she gets benefits. She gets benefits. Yeah. We get paid more money. I'm on deployment. It's like fucking awesome. There were guys that married girls just for an arrangement. You get benefits and I get more pay. I mean, not in our community because we're defined yeah, yeah, by our yeah, exactly. integrity. You guys are a lot more responsible. <laughs> yeah, a seal would never do something like that. Of course that. not. No, no, we would never do anything like that. But um, Leah's family, let's just say she is East Coast Italian family. So there's already 200 Holy people. Holy shit. Yeah. I, they were all awesome, by the way. Let's just say it was the complete opposite experience of the first time, which was a complete different planning experience. So I, we had, I was just like, okay. Let's do this. And then we got the fuck out of there and went to the origin camp, which was an amazing follow-up. We basically had a jujitsu honeymoon. Uh huh. So she got to go teach. And then, uh, yeah, you're just fucking fighting for your life on these goddamn masks. People are like, oh, yeah, today's my day. It's Andy Stump. He's the cleared hot guy. Some of them would say that. Oh, really? Oh, well, they would come up to me wearing my rash guard and be like, hey, man, do you want to roll? I'm like, fuck, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Slap bump and <clears throat> you just feel that first grip. You're like, okay. Yeah. We, shall we begin? To the death. I mean, why not? Or after five minutes. And man, I tell my, my jiu-jitsu students all the time that jiu-jitsu will enrich your life off the mats more than it's going to enrich your life on the mats. And like, look at the community of people you built, and you met a woman that you're going to share the rest of your life with. Yeah. 
by partaking in jujitsu. And, and she is like literally right now probably choking a bitch down at Masters World. <laughs> yeah. Her first her first match is in like an hour. Oh, really? Yeah, from a woman from Finland, which I'm not actually sure is actually a country. <laughs> yeah. But she's going to come a long way to get fucking choked. That's awesome, dude. <laughs> she's won it, I think, twice at uh, Masters at Black Belt, and then she won adult, I think it was Blue Belt, and medaled at Purple as well. Okay. Yeah, like you said, she, when you <laughs> roll with her first time. <laughs> Such a good story. <laughs> yeah, for those of you that don't remember, last time I was on Cleared Hot, <laughs> I rolled with Leia, and she had a breast cancer awareness belt. It was October, belt. so it's yeah. like a purple or um, it's pink, a pink belt. belt. Pink belt. But I didn't yeah. know that that was a thing, so I was like, oh, that's like a super old, faded purple belt. And when we rolled, I was like, fuck, dude. She's good, man. <laughs> this is the nastiest purple belt I've ever rolled why, with. Why the fuck haven't you been promoted? And remember that, like, I thought that the whole training session it, oh, that's right. Yeah, I didn't figure that out till we were sitting right here. And I was like, man, she's good. That's a nasty, <laughs> that's a nasty purple belt. And you go, bro, she's a black belt world champion. <laughs> yeah, I go, yeah. Feel better now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I mean, I enjoy rolling, but what I think what I enjoy the most about jujitsu is that it's not a solvable problem. Yeah. It the the I think the more exposure you have to it, it just presents different problems, which presents more and more and more. And out at that origin camp, I mean I was telling you today, you see these black belts, and I'm like, I don't know how many stripes are on that. I'm not even going to try to count because they're so close together, and it would be awkward for me to stare at it like that. But to see them so fascinated by it still and enjoying it still, and then they'll roll like uh, uh, Dedeco and Rafael Formiga. Um, and I believe Rafael is a Dedeco black belt. He was – people – Individually, like he, that, he was the best guy on the mat for sure, experience level wise. And to watch them go at it, a student, because they did do one role like one of the last days, Dedeco kind of slid over. And he, I, I swear he said like kombach or something, which is one of the few Brazilian words yeah, that I knew. Uh, fight. <laughs> yeah, to for me and for him, was like, okay, and like tied his belt up. And they went at it super controlled, smiling, sweeping each other, exchanging positions. And to see them still enjoying it that much at that high of a level and to be able to do that like it's not possible to master which is what i think i love about it the most yeah because if you could master it much like the man who was picking up the mats at the gym we were at today saying my brother is a taekwondo black belt bro, I was taekwondo just, black belt i was just being nice i was not <laughs> I, I do it's funny because he, I didn't know if he was a student or what, right? I don't, I don't think I'd ever seen that person in my life before, which is why I felt comfortable. I didn't say too much, but <laughs> no, he walks in and he goes, Hey, how long have you been doing martial arts? I'm like 19 years. He goes, my, my brother's a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. I was like, Oh, cool. He needs to be fighting MMA. <laughs> I was just like, okay. And then you go, he's going to need a lot more than that. If he wants to get in the cage or something. I was like, Oh, Andy always shoots people straight. Yeah. And then he started listing <laughs> off the other stuff that he, he does did. tempo he does krav maga and it's like great congratulations yeah we're very happy for him <laughs> i mean if you can get a black belt into martial art in like two years i think yeah what's it worth i don't know yeah well it's not worth anything that's the truth i know? mean i'm sure you can get some good i mean i do i'm sure there's a crowd of, like we're literally over a karate studio right now and there's a bunch of kids in there i'm sure there's there's discipline and lesson learn lessons that you can learn from that but I don't know how well it's going to serve you in a very violent physical altercation. And th and that's the thing, man. Like the 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 cat's out of the bag. We know what arts win fights. The UFC proved that, right? And so, like, it, well, not with Krav because it's so dangerous. It's so, that it can't yeah, it's so dangerous that if I <laughs> if I did it in real life, you die. Okay. So, I have some great so, friends who do Krav, and honestly, I don't know that much about it, but I I. I have to laugh at that reasoning a little bit. Bro, if you can't spar at 100%, then you can't hone your skill set. Yeah. So that that argument right there is invalid, you know? And it's like, we know boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, jujitsu, and judo has a lot of good application too. But it's it's very clear what works and then what is more of a an art for kids and discipline. Like you said, if kids are doing that stuff, they're moving their bodies, they're learning, they're building community. I'm not talking shit on that stuff, yeah. but if you want to build a skill set to be able to protect yourself and protect your family, 
everybody already knows what works and what doesn't work, you know? And here's the thing, man. If, uh, if there, if there was some specialist that some grand master that of dim mock with the death touch or whatever, he'd be in the octagon taking dudes like Israel Adesanya out and, make, and, and making millions and millions of dollars, <laughs> right? Cash and checks. And so, yeah, yeah. right there. Bullshit. The more I do jujitsu, the more I develop a love for guns. Because <laughs> I don't know, man. Like you're fucking jujitsu, <laughs> and this isn't fucking like trying to stroke your ego. But your jujitsu's gotten really fucking good, really fast, man. I just and, go train every day. I mean, your belt's a, a reflection of that too. I mean, how long have you been training now? Five years? Four years? Four years. Brown belt, and not just. I told you how I got it, though. My you're, coach was walking just... <laughs> around, and he left a belt on the counter, and I was like, "That shit's mine," because I forgot my belt, and he just didn't stop me. Well, bro, I can tell you, like, <laughs> there's different levels of black belts. Like, I've there's heard a, that there, the black belt range is, is greater than every other belt combined. For sure. It's vast. There's dudes that I fucking beat the shit out of, and I'm like, you, sh you feel like a new blue belt. What is going on? And then there's other black belts that do that to me. Yeah. Bushesha. When that guy puts his hands on me, it's like I've never trained an hour of jujitsu in my entire life. That's why I like commenting on the posts that you put up with him. I'm like, Greg, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. just stand up. Yeah, just, why would yeah, you let just, him do that? Why are you letting him do that to you? <laughs> and then there's everything in between, right? Yeah. And so, like, I mean, that's what's so fascinating about jujitsu is that it's an endless ocean. But I also know how good my jujitsu is and I'm proud of my jujitsu. And I know that like I stack up well against a lot of guys. I couldn't pass your fucking guard today. I didn't want you to try to arm arm me. Again. Dude. And I was just like, <laughs> it, and, and it was it, it, like you said, it's problem solving, right? Yeah. And you were able, and I consider myself a good passer. You were able to shut my whole fucking passing game down with one grip. Well, I also figured out you were trying to reach across and get my other leg. I'm like, I'll just move it over here a little bit. Bro, yeah. And, <laughs> and it was, what, seven minutes of that yeah. over the course of a round and a half or whatever? Yeah. And then also, like, in a live role, and it's not like you're upset, but once you're trying something and it's not working, fuck. And now, you, now that problem solving comes into play, right? <laughs> so I'm going to try and be a little more dynamic. So I tried to move a little faster, and then you match my speed perfectly. And that's what I told you. I said, bro, like when I'm playing pressure and heavy, you can move slow and be heavy too. And as soon as I tried to pick up the speed, you match that speed. I'm just trying to haunt your dreams. <laughs> yeah. You, I, well, I, I told you before we rolled, <laughs> I laid in bed last night and, and visualized how to finish the arm bar on you. Because last time we rolled, you had an interesting arm bar defense and I didn't even get to the fucking position to try it. So that's the best defense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You it's like, why would I let somebody put me in that position? The Hickson answer. Which I am by no means saying that I am not comparing myself to Hickson, but I love that answer. And I'm, shit, if Henry told me it, I guess I'd be first, like, third hand at this point. But he'll be asked about these positions, and his response is, why would I be there? Yeah. <laughs> but then the other side of that coin is somebody else gets a vote in how this plays out. For sure. You know? But what I do like about it, too, is that we can go hard, and at the end of it, you're it, there's no ballistic injury there's nobody hurt i agree with you if you can't spar at a high level because it's so dangerous how how do you sharpen that blade yeah because you have to learn those movements and the connection and the angles and the i talk to my students about it all the time a, the majority of jujitsu is invisible mm. because it's that it's that weight distribution that you can feel but you can't see you're and, not going to notice the difference on yeah, the video yeah and all of those details get honed during live rolls I can't teach weight distribution. You have to learn that through hours and hours and hours of people doing knee on belly or you're, you're trying to sweep a guy and he's basing too hard. Okay, how do I defeat this base? All those little nuances take a long time to put together. And it's like, you can't do that sparring at 20% or whatever. And so, but I mean, everybody thinks their shit's the best, right? So <laughs> we're just a cult as well. Oh, it meets every criteria. Of a cult. <laughs> yeah. But so does CrossFit, the other part of your gym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're smashing two cults together. That's perfect. You want to know the interesting thing about that is, so my gym's outside of Seattle, and we're CrossFit and Jiu-Jitsu, and I thought there'd be a lot of crossover. There's, there's not? There's hardly any. Why do you think that is? It's just, it's just a, different, a different mentality. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's hmm. probably three or four people 
that do both. And then each side of the gym has 200 members. So it's... That's crazy because the gas tank they would bring to the mats is not awesome. Well, dude, the thing about CrossFit is, is like you're a super athlete, but jujitsu is not only about being a good athlete. It's about energy management. Yeah. And if you can't manage your energy, I mean, how long can a human being sprint for? It is what it is. You know, it is what it is. If you try and turn the dial up to 10, you have less than a minute in the reserve. And we'll have people come up from downstairs and try that. And it's like, okay, you're a super athlete, but for you, 60 seconds, for 60 seconds, and then you get mauled. And that's, uh, I deeply appreciate that actually, bro. And that's jujitsu. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, go hard when you need to slow it down when you need to. And if one thing that I do is I try and breathe through my nose when I'm rolling. If I feel I have to start taking, if I have to start gasping for air, that lets me know I'm not managing my energy too well. And, uh, if you're not managing your energy well, that's like fatigue makes cowards of us all. That's a learned skill, though. For and sure. You, oh, you've, been, yeah, yeah, you've yeah. been on the mats for almost two decades. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I think everybody goes through that journey of fifth gear, maximum energy expenditure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the only grip that I will ever have in my life, so I hold it so hard that I shake. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you, yeah, that's, that's a learned skill for sure. Henry's the same way. He, fuck, it's like he's playing with you. Nah. He's, at, he's at that level, like you said, the variation in black belts. He's at the level where, you've, where you're like, okay, so you can see the future, right? Like, what stocks should I invest in? He doesn't know the <laughs> answer to that. But he's seen those movement patterns so many times, and he knows the two available options you have, and will funnel you to one and knows the three steps, and it's just like, I'll wait for you at the end of this. Yeah, it's crazy, dude. It's fucking terrifying. But that's also what makes it so intriguing, because it's like, what other activity can you need so much physicality with, but you're also like literally problem solving at the highest level. You know, I think that's why people get addicted to it. That, and I don't think most people have physical experiences anymore. I felt, so I had, I owned a CrossFit gym in, we opened it in 2000 and, was it late 2006? Call it 2007 to split the difference. And it was earlier on in the, in the, story arc and ascension of CrossFit being uh, as popular as it become. And I was I was shocked by the number of people who just were not physically active at all in their life and they find that first visceral physical experience and it hooks them. Yeah. I think jiu-jitsu is kind of the same way. Yeah. There's, people aren't as active as they used to be, I don't think. Well, dude, everybody's fucking pumping themselves full of medication for anxiety and depression. Everybody has all of these ailments and they're overweight. And it's like, dude, the solution's right in front of you, but it just takes a little work. And people like we were talking about it, walking up here, you put, you put a roadblock in front of people and a lot of people are just, that's where they stop. Even if it's not real. Yeah. So I, I do Friday episodes where I answer Q and A. I still have to record the one for tomorrow, but full, full auto Friday, a little full. I was going to ask you if I can, start a segment called semi-automatic Saturday <laughs> semi-auto Saturday yeah. I like it sass sass for you. you do whatever the fuck you want to do my buddy fuck Jack Carr had started a podcast called danger close I'm like motherfucker <laughs> he actually yeah. asked me before I'm like do you do whatever you yeah, do of course. I don't care but so not too long ago there was a death in buds and which sucks but you know comma I think it's essential that the training is hard enough and difficult enough that that's a potential outcome. I'm not hoping for that outcome. And so a guy named David Phillips just wrote an article in the New York Times about this. And so my inbox has been flooded with people asking me, what do you think about the article? And I've actually, I almost had Dave, uh, I don't know, David or Dave, I forget which one he likes to go by. I've talked to him on the phone because I wanted him to come up on the podcast because he did a bunch of stuff around Eddie as well too, uh, Eddie Gallagher. So I was reading the article and again, it's interesting. I'm not, I don't want to say that he's biased, but the way that you write things can take an issue and it's like, oh, we'll look at it from this angle as opposed to maybe taking a wider optic. And one of the things that I found fascinating was it talked about the attrition or success rate, depending on how you want to look at it. It's like, okay, in the 80s, 40% of the people made it through. In the early 2000s, that dropped to 29% of the people made it through. And then in the modern era, in the class that this kid died in, it was 10%. And they're viewing it from the lens. You're saying the the attrition rate is that or the success, success rate. rate? So success rate in the 80s was 40%, then down to 29%. And then in this kid's class, the one that died, it was 10%. Okay. And the way that he wrote it, 
And the, the paragraph before and after was talking about it's too hard. You know, it's excessive. It's too dangerous. <clears throat> and there's another way to look at it, which I think is the more important question. Let's assume that the curriculum has been the exact same from beginning to end. Maybe the quality of person that is attempting the training is the fucking variable, mm -hmm. not the training itself. Maybe when people talk way back to you know, the greatest generation, the hardest motherfuckers that have ever been on the face of planet Earth who went and fought trench warfare and then worked at a fucking auto dealership <laughs> yeah. and said nothing about it and then did like- What's PTSD? Yeah, fucking plumbing afterwards and just chain smoked themselves <laughs> to death, which I'm not saying that's a great path either. Those dudes used to hammer in railroad spikes with the head of their dick. That's uh -huh. how fucking yeah. hard they were. People are soft as fuck in the modern era. So if the curriculum's the same, maybe what we should be looking at is the people. Well, and also- But it, that article is like, no, you know what I mean? Like, it's a weird way to look at it. The more important question to me is from the other perspective. Like, are we creating soft fucking people? So yeah, they're not going to be as successful on a very difficult training program. And when was last time someone died in BUDS? Before that, I believe it was uh, a drowning, an aspiration. There's a, a, a evolution called what was called the, the hive or the beehive, and it's in first phase. And they get everybody in the pool, and you're fully clothed, and they start taking off articles of clothing, and they start really compressing people around. The instructors are kind of pushing people towards the middle, which becomes Lord of the Flies real fast. Yeah. They're like, hey, take a boot off. So you'll get a breath to go underwater to take your boot off, and it's like... <laughs> your spot to come back up is no longer there. It's fucked up. And fucking humanity comes screeching to a halt as people are getting drugged down. So I guess a student went underwater and uh, threw up underwater, aspirated on it. They got it, you know, at that, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, so they weren't able to revive him. But I think in the article it said since its inception, 11 people have died okay. in training. So that's since the 40s. Yeah, I mean, the reality of it is, is you need to look at what occurred. Yeah. And... Is there something that we can tweak? Was this uh, the fault of the curriculum potentially, or I mean, I don't what what have they ruled the cause of death on the the latest one? It was um, what the fuck was it? I think it's sipe, pulmonary edema. Uh, this is where Michael needs a microphone because he could look this up. His name is Kyle Mullen, I believe, the kid that died. Uh, but it, it had to, it was, so it was at the end of Hell Week. He had made it through Hell Week and they called uh, medical services, I think on the Saturday to get him there and he expired in the hospital. Another student had to be intubated. Um, and it's not an, it's not a common thing, but it's also not uncommon. I mean, you're awake for five days, you're submerged in the water. Another thing that the article left out, and I know this because I have a, a close friend whose son was in that Hell Week class, is that it was ungodly cold, like uncommonly cold for San Diego, the water and the ambient air temperature. So yes, of course the fucking success rate is gonna be lower. Yeah, That wasn't mentioned in the article either. So I'm saying like, it's really easy to frame it in one way. Whereas I think the better question is just, are we creating soft motherfuckers in society? And what I, what I can say is having gone through as a student, going back as an instructor from 06 to October of 08, it, there, was, it, there was a difference for sure. And, and if I use my own kids as a metric and I see their social circle, I it, it's like, I don't know if we're making the, the next greatest generation or the next softest generation. Bro, I mean, I, I think every generation says this, like, this new generation's a bunch of pussies, you know? Probably. But if you look at most 20-year-old kids these days, it's hard to come to any other conclusion than there's something going on here. There's something fucking going on. Like, I'm only 41. Like, we're not that old, right? It's, I'm super old. It seemed like fucking yesterday that I was 20 years old fighting dudes behind bars and doing all the dumb shit that young, young men do. But young men are not being young men anymore. And it's like, you know, you go to Starbucks and you, there's all these 20-year-old kids with zero muscle tone they look pale they have like bags under their eyes and it's like <laughs> are you fucking sick or something like what's super going on? judgy greg <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah i'm judgy but it's the truth man and it's like i honestly think like because i'm a conspiracy theorist as you said right or t you could say that or you could say you like to wear a tinfoil hat i'm gonna let <laughs> yeah. you choose bro do I'm you have a tinfoil liner in that hat right now <laughs> yeah, yeah fuck i didn't check 
a lot of Americans are not subjecting themselves to any type of adver- adversity. Yeah. And it's like you need adversity for growth, both physically, spiritually, emotionally, like everything. You want to become smart? You better fucking go to start studying. And studying's not fun. Studying yeah. sucks, dude. And it's just every single aspect of your life. You know, I actually I posted a video yesterday of a podcast I did where I was talking about this. It's like since the beginning of mankind, if you wanted to eat, you better go hunt or forage. Both those activities are hard. Both those activities take energy and take effort. If you want to be warm, you better fucking chop wood all all summer and stockpile it and build a sufficient cabin so you don't freeze to death. If you want to be safe, you better build an army of people that can protect your village. Like everything about being a human being, the experience was difficult and dangerous, but that's what made people tough and resilient. And then in the last, what, 70 years, life became easy. And I think we're on this downward trajectory because no one's going through adversity. And some people self-impose that adversity. Like guys like us, for whatever reason, I want to go do this. And we got to experience a lot of adversity as a young man. But there's a lot of people that never go through anything. Yeah. And it's not good for them, man. I think the exposure to it when we were younger, it definitely helped. It. My first exposure to adversity was working for my fucking dad on a construction site. Uh (laughs) Surrounded (laughs) by... Just to say it, it was an environment that was uh, not family safe and not OSHA. <laughs> we won't get into the fucked up shit he asked me to do when I was like 11. On a... Oh, you're... I remember the first time he let me use a jackhammer. He's like, uh, yeah, just tie this rope around your uh, waist and go stand on top of the fireplace and start shaving it off. Was, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. It's fucking best day of my life, by the way. It's like, then also, a lot of the times it would end with, don't tell your mom any of this shit. <laughs> I'm just yeah. up there. 30 fucking feet up in the air with a rope. I don't even know if the other end of the rope was attached to anything. Probably was just a fucking comfort rope and just shaving off. Not a climbing rope that has give when you fall. It just snap your, oh, no. just snap your spine. No, it was the same rope that we would tie fucking equipment down on in this truck. <laughs> I think I actually went over to the truck and tied it around myself. Yeah, like a 12-year-old should not be using a jackhammer three stories up. But that... But when I got to Bud's, I'm like, oh, fuck, this this isn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> so that that early on, I mean, I don't know. Now it seems like there's an app for everything. Like you said, the the foraging and going out and providing that stuff, <clears throat> Uber Eats, DoorDash, and which is super convenient. But if it, that's bro, all you know and, and you can sit on your couch and just bleep. Dude, there was a uh, – I'm not going to throw him under the bus because he's basically a family member of mine. But we were, at, <laughs> <laughs> we were at my gym. And we needed to go to Target. It's one turn. It's from one highway to another highway. And it's about four miles. And it's in the same town, right? And I hop in his car. And he was 16 at the time. Just got his license, you know? Should be fired up to drive. And pulls his phone out and types Target in. I said, what the fuck are you doing? I'm putting Target in my GPS. I said, yeah, I see that. That's why I'm asking, what the fuck are you doing? He goes, dude, we're going to Target. What do you mean? I said, it's one turn. You can't get there without your GPS? He goes, I don't know. I've never I've never really thought about like actually ha- like cardinal directions on how to get there. And so I started asking the young kids. Most high school kids don't even know what north, south, east, and west is. And it's like I mean, they have to have heard of it before. But yeah, but they don't but know I'm how to saying orient. like, yeah, if you're where I'm sitting right now in your house, can you point north? Uh, no. And bro, these phones, and I'm just as guilty as everyone. Oh, for sure. If you took my phone right now and looked at my screen time, I'd be fucking embarrassed, dude. <laughs> but, but we have to we have to balance that out with still being grounded in reality. Yeah. You know? And it's like, if everything becomes too easy, that's not a fucking good thing, man. Map and compass is a good skill to have. Dude, that's one of the best skill sets to this day yeah. that I took away from the military. Step one, orient your map. Yep. Or and, don't, if you want it to be really an adventure, I mean. But being able to find a point on a map yeah. is a skill set that I think every human being should need. Like, dude, I climbed uh, I climbed Mount Olympus last summer with that my same boy, Levi. He was 17 at the time. And Washington State wants all these different permits to be able to climb and camping permits. And it's just like, and you can get fined this and that. And I'm like, I'm just going in the fucking mountains, okay? And part of my tinfoil hat shit, I'm real over the government lately. Weird. Yeah, I know. You wouldn't understand yeah, that if you followed fucking, you. <laughs> <laughs> when I got to fucking, I got to pay somebody some amount of money so I can go walk in the mountains, I have a fucking problem with that. So we just went in the mountains. I don't give a fuck. I'm not paying. 
And then here comes this park ranger doing a, a compliance check, making sure that everybody has their permits to be on the mountain. And she gets over to me and she goes, hey, uh, I know this is uh, going to sound kind of weird, but I actually am just wondering if you can show me where I'm at on the map. <laughs> and I was like, what? And she goes, yeah, it's... it's Doesn't she work there? Yeah, she's the park ranger doing the compliance check. And she goes, I walked way up this trail and I got a little disoriented. Do you know where we're at? And I said, yes, I know exactly where we're at. So pull your map out, pick up a pine needle like ranger school because you never point to a map with your finger, right? Why would you? Yeah. <laughs> you can't be precise. And I'm Or like, the spider co open the very yeah, tip exactly, of the knife. Right? <laughs> and I was like, we are right here and oriented her and got her dialed in. And then I was like, is this bitch going to fucking now come after me for being unpermitted. It would be amazing if she did. She did not though. She did was... you ask her for her permit? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> no, she was super gracious and kind to me. So I was like, okay, cool. But I, I was already thinking, I was like, if this fucking bitch ask me where she's at and then finds me, I will be talking to her fucking supervisor. <laughs> I mean, let's not forget, Greg, you used to be the park ranger. Bro, I know. Like, Where do you think you, what would you be up to right now if you had not sat in that car that day? And made oh, video? bro, I think about that. All the time. How long ago was that? We're coming up on three May, years? May 5th of 2020 okay. was the video. So for people that don't know. Yeah, you should explain it yeah, a little bit so it can see Yeah, yeah because you've had me on a couple times, but I can't assume that everybody listens to every episode. Yeah. I was a police officer in Seattle that spoke out against the COVID tyranny and the COVID lockdowns. And not just the lockdowns, but the way they were utilizing law enforcement to be able to enforce these. Because as a police officer... I believe that laws need to be legislated. And I mean, we've talked about, we talked about that on our previous episodes. So I spoke out against it and said, Hey guys, and I was speaking to the profession in that video. I was like, this is not who we are. This is not what we do. Okay. We serve the public and we can only enforce laws that are legislated and on the books. And if your governor or your mayor tells you to do things that are outside of that, not only should you say no, I think that you're morally obligated to both just the law and also our oath to refuse those orders. Well, the governor didn't like that. Shocking, right? And uh, I was terminated immediately for that. And uh, bro, best thing that's ever happened to me in my entire fucking life. Because it forced me to step outside of what's comfortable. And even though being a police officer, it's a hard job and it's it's demanding and it's it's emotionally stressful, it's also pretty simple. You put the uniform on, you clock in, you do your hours, you go home. You have good pay, you have good benefits. My mortgage is going to get paid. My kids are going to get taken care of. Like, I know that life is going to go on. It's very consistent. That's what I'm saying, you know? <clears throat> and a lot of people need that. But when they told me, my department's like, and the way they did it was just, I mean, we talked about it before, but they're like, hey, Greg, we agree with your message. We agree with everything that you said, and we, we know that you're a good cop and, and your message is good, but you can't be saying that stuff publicly. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm a police officer that can't say that I should be defending people's constitutional rights publicly, it's probably time that we go our separate ways. And we did. And what it allowed me to do was put a tremendous amount of effort into my jiu-jitsu academy. Then you invited me on here, and I did Cleared Hot. I mean, that was like a week after that video went viral. Yeah. You were like one of the first people to reach out well, to Well, fuck. Me. People were just like, you got to reach out to this guy. I'm like, I'll, I'll fucking try. It was, a fucking, it was nuts, bro. Yeah. Then after I did Cleared Hot the first time, my inbox started getting filled up with people saying, bro, do a podcast. Yeah. Do a podcast. And at first, I thought that was kind of silly. But then I was like, you know what? A lot of fucking people do podcasts. Why not give it a try and see where it goes? And remember, I texted you. I said, bro, what do I need to start a podcast? You Actually, the text was, what exactly do I need? <laughs> Write me a list. <laughs> and dude, and I, was, I was out on my boat texting you. And I, I remember I told you that. Boat. And you're like, I hope it fucking sinks because I hate boats. But this is what you need. <laughs> and so I bought all the equipment and had no idea what I was doing and just started a podcast. And now we're on episode 116 that came out last week. And I mean, we talked about it at the gym. 50,000 downloads a month is, is awesome. Child's play compared to some some platforms. Most, so it's here's what's startling. Do a little research on the average uh, per episode downloads in a 30 day time period. Most, from what you can find, nobody ever really wants to talk about numbers, but from what you can find, it's like 200. Yeah. 
No, Cause, it's because there's a fucking million podcasts, but that doesn't mean a million people have something that's actually, I guess it would be interesting to the potential recipient. And so I kind of had like the perfect storm where I had a background in special operations as a ranger. And then I was with the feds for a while. I was with the locals for a while. I had about 10 years in law enforcement. And then you invited me on here and people enjoyed that show. And immediately we were getting a pretty high amount of downloads. Yeah. And my production company that I work with, they're called Operation Podcast. They're out of Los Angeles. They're like, bro, we've never seen a new show do as well as your show. And because of that, a bunch of sponsorships started coming in. And I mean, I hear you say it all the time. Don't do a fucking podcast trying to get rich. No. But the other side of it is if your podcast does well, you will do well. They can become lucrative. Yeah. And uh, our podcast is doing almost as much as I made like when I first became a deputy. And it's like. You should just rebrand the name. Endless Endeavor is great. But it could be the tinfoil hat. <laughs> yeah, I suspect, bro. though. Hey, hey, hey I suspect no, 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 that that shit's taken, though. Let's. Uh, we'll. we'll de- <laughs> we're we're going to delve into that. We're going to delve into that in a second, because the fucking government is doing things that is undeniable now. Take it easy, sir. <laughs> you used to be the government. I know it's crazy to think about that. What do they call those people? I see. Sometimes I get. They call, what do they call us? Is it bootlickers? Is that what they call us? <laughs> yeah, dude. I was one time. I was on a hunting trip. <clears throat> one time this was fucking last year uh, we were staying at a lodge because we were out at the fucking middle of nowhere in a wall tent in sustained 50 knot gusts and let me just tell you that massive sail with the little metal and it didn't do well against the wind so we executed a contingency plan and went and stayed somewhere else <laughs> mostly because the tent detonated uh, we had no other choice <laughs> I don't know how to accurately describe the owners slash operators of this establishment. We got a room and uh, that I mean, we were exhausted because, of course, the fucking tent rips at like two in the morning. Why so we're wouldn't like, it? Of course. It's, so we were like, like literally just stacking heavy shit on top of light shit so we could go sleep in the front seat of our car until the sun came up so we could go pick that shit up and get out of it. I'm still missing fucking gear. Probably an elk right now wearing my pants somewhere in eastern Montana. And we get to this establishment. We're fucking tired. Check in, though. We get a meal. We lay down. And the, <clears throat> the owner slash operator, they decide to get into a screaming match. It's a husband and a wife. And... Let's just say they were touched. They were special. And he's yelling and she, fuck you. I'm fucking turning you into the CIA. They fucking know where you are. I'm like, oh, he's one of them. Oh, yeah. So Leah and I are laying in bed. And then my <laughs> business partner, Dever, and his partner, Erica, they're one roof over. And I'm just, at this point, I'm fascinated. I'm like, fucking keep this going because this is amazing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's any physical harm going on, but they're yelling some shit at each other, like deeply... Like, I'm fucking turning you into the government, blah, 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 blah. Next morning, I go down to get coffee, and the guy's sitting down there by the fire, and I'm just warming up, and he goes, hey, man, what's going on? I'm like, nothing, just getting a cup of coffee. He's like, so what do you do for a living? Which is a question I hate, and now it's easy, because I go, hey, I'm a coffee shop. Yeah. And it's, like, easy to talk to. I'm like, oh, I, you know, I host a podcast. He's like, yeah, but what'd you do before that? <laughs> it's like, well, I was in the military. He goes, how did it feel to be a pit bull? For the global elitists. Oh, Go- God, dude. <laughs> Traveling around. He used the word cabal, which I still don't actually know the fucking proper way to use it. But, it, like, you know, how did it feel to, I think he said a chained pit bull to do the bit. And I'm just like, and I just looked at him and I said, that wasn't really my experience. And just finished my coffee and got up and left. And, bro, this is what I tell people when they say that shit. Because it's like. I look at the government now and I'm very untrusting of them. And I think that there is a lot of corruption that's inside of the government. I don't think that's even deniable. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? But when you look at what I did on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, if you wanna if you wanna take a if you wanna detach and take a global view, should we have been there? I mean, we can talk about that. Yeah. And the older I get, the more I reflect and think that, man, was it fucking worth that your friends getting killed and the the shit that we did to just one day randomly pull out and be done? Like, I reflect on that stuff and think it seems like it doesn't make much sense. But then the other side of it is, man, that was the path that built me into who I am today. Yeah. And all those experiences and everything that I did and all the relationships that I built, man, I wouldn't trade it for anything. That was a necessary part of my path. And... Young men are driven to conflict 
just because we're young men. And it's like, I didn't join the military. I mean, I, I joined pre 9-11 as well, just because I was kind of lost. And it's like, oh, what am I going to do, you know? But going to combat, and uh, I, and I didn't have nearly the combat experience. That, like you, I listened to you and Glover talk, and it's like, fuck, man. <laughs> Fucking stacking bodies like cordwood, you, you know? Be careful what you ask for, though. No, of course, yeah. Two-way ranges yeah, kind of exactly. suck. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I, I had enough of it. I got to taste enough of it and get in some gunfights and shit and understand, like, okay, when when where the rubber meets the road, I know that I can be courageous. I know I can act without fear. And, like, it kind of made me... It, it almost like reassures you who you are as a man. Like, Oh yeah, I passed that test. I'm proud of myself. Right. And I think young men are kind of drawn to that. Take the political stuff out of it. Cause look at who we are fighting too. Like when I was in Ramadi, Iraq in 04 and 05, dude, there was, there was guys from Syria and Yemen yeah. and they were doing the same thing as us. Yeah. Young men. It was their call wanted, to jihad. Yeah. They wanted to get it on and they wanted to test themselves on the field of battle. So here you are, you got all these 20 something year old men coming from all over the world and we're killing each other in the streets of Ramadi. And it's kind of fucking crazy, right? But you know what? That's what we wanted to be doing too. Yeah. And so like I can I can say coulda, shoulda, woulda or the the government did this or the government did that, but at the end of the day, it wasn't a fucking draft. I was there on my own free will. So I can't point the finger and bitch and cry about it, you know? And then the other side of it is, like I said, it grew me to who I am today. And I think I'm proud of all that. And I think it was necessary, you know? I think there's also a huge gap between, if you look at like a pyramid, I guess, the people at the top of the pyramid and where we were exactly. at, the, at the very bottom. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you know, to go back to that guy's comment, it, inside I'm just laughing. I'm like, holy fucking shit. I can't get out of this room fast enough. <laughs> and I will avoid a conversation with said individual uh, at lunch and dinner, if uh -huh. we happen to be back, yeah. then I'm like, Roger that, buddy. I have a pretty good idea. You're in the tinfoil hat brigade, which maybe you're a part of. I'm not even sure. Bro, so. here's here's the reality of it, though. <laughs> the more you look into the globalists and the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and all these people, there is a lot of dark shit going on. Yeah. That's true. That's that's no longer debatable, right? I mean, they, they publicly state you will own nothing and love it. And that's like their goals of the future are not in alignment with my goals of the future. And that's okay, right? Yeah. But there's also a chance that that turns into conflict someday because that's, that's what happens with humanity. Read a fucking history book. People have different ideas of where they want society to go, and then we find ourselves in conflict. And if that happens, that happens. And this, I talk about it on my show all the time. Don't live in a triggered state or a fearful state. Don't let the maybes or the what ifs, like like that guy, he's probably consumed by it, right? I think it's what he lives all day, every and day. That's, and that's letting them dictate your happiness and your energy and your fucking spirit. For me, if the world goes fucking down some dark spiral where the globalists are trying to take us over and all of these things that people think are a potential possibility, okay. I'll, then I'll fucking deal with it and I'm prepared to deal with it because I have a lot of fucking guns I'm fit I have a lot of good fucking friends that are highly trained like okay if that happens it happens but in the meantime I'm going to grow my jiu-jitsu business I'm going to raise my kids I'm going to keep doing my podcasts I'm going to try and get wealthy oh you can't say that aspiring to be wealthy is a bad thing now right is it if I, some people hate on it you know but what I'm, is considered a good thing at this point in time? yeah who, who fucking knows man but it's uh for me, it's super inspiring and it's it's super motivating to see for the longest time I was I was in the hamster wheel of trading hours for money, right? You trade hours for your life for money. And as long as you're stuck on that hamster wheel, man, you're never going to fucking get out of it. That's your life, right? Yeah. I just read a book called, uh, or I'm reading it, it's called uh, The Urban Monk again. And one thing that they talk about, it's like, Dude, you don't trade hours for money. You trade your value for money. And once you actually, and I think we've talked about it before, like I had imposter syndrome for a long time too. You know, a lot of people looked at me like- As a cop? Just as a, as a man. Really? You know? I was a black belt. I was an army ranger. A lot of people looked at me like, dude, you should have the answers, you know? And it's like, dude, I, I don't even fucking know myself. To a narrow set of questions. That, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. And it's like- Dude, at the time, my marriage was kind of in shambles. I was going through some depression. Like, I'm not, I don't feel very proud of who I am. Like, I don't think I've arrived at a point where I have this life figured out. And over the last 24 months, I feel like I'm arriving at a place. I'm very content with who I am. 
And, and a big part of that is figuring out how to be you for a living. Now, I'm not saying everybody can quit their job and just dick off at a jiu-jitsu academy and do podcasts. But you know what? I, I mean, I say this often. I'm making a lot more money teaching jiu-jitsu and podcasting than I ever made as a law enforcement officer. So Yeah, but it's based off of your time and experience as a law enforcement officer. Of course and, it is. Yeah, and yeah. your mil- You know what I mean? No, no, no. Yeah, and that's can. the thing. People can do it, but you you can't look at Greg now and dismiss what got you 100%. There. But people do that. Yeah, no. The must, sure. the must be nice crowd. There is a period of time, and I think that uh, you have to be on the grind. You know, when you graduate high school until you're probably somewhere around our age, you have to be that worker bee. You have to be putting in the hours. That's where you build your credibility. That's where you learn about yourself. That's where you develop your skill sets. You don't have to do any of that. You do have to do that. No, you, you don't. You, you because do you can be... 22 on Instagram putting out fucking <laughs> stripper <laughs> wisdom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> you always take the conversations to down the crazy rabbit holes. <laughs> but fucking bro, the other side of that is like I think a lot of people they think that because between the ages of 20 to 35 to 40 being in that hamster wheel that that's their whole life. And I've, I've had so many police officers reach out to me in the last 24 months. Now that I've kind of built a little bit of a platform, they see the path that I walked. Now they see that I'm free and they're like, I want to do that, but I just never could. And a lot of people tell themselves this lie that because of what they used to do, that that's what they have to do in the future. And bro, that's not true. Yeah. We can fucking build whatever future you want. It's a sunken cost fallacy. Yeah. And you just have to believe in it. You have to put the time, you have to put the energy, and then you have to put the work in, but it's fucking there. Yeah. And each one of us holds the power to be able to do amazing things. I mean, we talked about it as we were literally walking in this building. I bought 30 acres out in the woods. I built a firearm range. And when I bought that property, a lot of people are like, you're fuck- you're crazy. What are you doing? Because it didn't have a driveway. And it was a mile long. I, n- I built a mile long driveway. And yeah, that was a, a long, arduous process. I started with a machete and then a weed whacker and then a chainsaw. And then I had to have a bunch of trucks brought in and machinery. And it ended up being like a $70,000 endeavor to build a one mile driveway. But guess what? My driveway is done now. And now I built a firearm range and fucking Mike Glover already booked it for a weekend and it sold out for, in three hours. And we're going to start running courses out there. And people sell themselves short and say you can't because of something as meaningless as a driveway. And it's like, motherfuckers are building robots and sending them to Mars, I could build a driveway. Like Elon Musk is doing, is building Neuralink so you can play video games with your mind. I Which sh- I'm not sure is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, bro, I can build a driveway, you know? Can but, you imagine the number of people who are gonna volunteer to have those test Neuralinks? Yeah, not me. They'll be like, here, it's fucking right here. Is this where you need to put it? So did you see the video? of the monkey playing the video game? No. Okay, so check it out on YouTube. There's a monkey and it's playing, what is it, Pong? Where the yep. the, the two paddles ping are moving pong, up and down. Ping pong. And he's playing it with this joystick. So he's operating it physically. How the fuck does the monkey know how to do that in the first place? Bro, I have so many questions. <laughs> I don't know, you'll have to see the video. <laughs> and then what they do is they implant this neural link. So now, as instead of him physically controlling it he's controlling the paddles with his mind but he's also still doing it with the joystick right so he's engaging that part of his mind that the neural link is in yeah but he's still doing it with the joystick simultaneously and i guess that like matches it up and then they unplug the joystick and now the joystick is no longer operational he thinks he's controlling it with the joystick but he's now controlling it with his mind it's fucking bizarre But that's where we're at. People need to go watch the documentary Planet of the Apes. Or Terminator. (laughs) Both of those would be a great starting point. At some point, it's like, we are we going to have to fucking nuke ourselves? Uh, Dude, (laughs) it's probably inevitable at some point. I... I wish I could say I had high hopes. <laughs> Bro, yeah. Humanity is the fucking greatest thing on planet Earth. And it's also the fucking most vile and destructive thing on, on planet Earth, you know? So are you distrustful of the government or the people that are that that are the government, the, the group of people? Because this is the one I struggle with. Like, democracy, I think, is a slippery slope as it is, you know? 
I actually don't know what the longest standing democracy is, but I think it's. I think we're coming up on it. I think we are too, and I think it's a fucking ice skating rink as it is. I'm more concerned with the people who make governance and occupation, which that's I don't exa- think it was ever intended to and be. And that's what they're doing on yeah. both sides of the fence. I am deeply distrustful of that. We have a bunch of 80-year-old motherfuckers in there. On a, Dude, they're super on a, sharp, though. On a government they're salary. They're super sharp. That are buying $25 million mansions. Yeah. Like, that. government is supposed to be of the people, for the people, by the people. And it was like, wasn't it George Washington that said, like, it's from the plow, and then you go serve, and then you go back to the plow. Like, it's a period of your time that you serve, and leadership should be a burden, right? Yeah. No one should go to, to be a fucking congressman or a senator to like, yes, dude, this is going to be my new career. It should be, oh, fuck, dude. Okay, I need to do this. And we're starting to see more candidates, like Tony Cowden. He came here and did this, he right? Did. Uh, that's a friend of mine and he ran and it didn't work out. Uh, Joe Kent is another buddy of mine and it looks like he's going to fucking win. And do you know Joe Kent? I don't. Okay. He's fucking awesome. You should have him on. Okay. He was a career, um, green beret and then some other stuff we'll talk about off air. Um, his wife was actually killed in Syria. Shannon Kent. Do you remember that story? Yes, I do. Okay. And, uh, he was deployed and she was deployed at the same time. They have two young sons and she got killed in Syria and he was like, I got to put this shit behind me. Yeah, you only, it's the only choice you have. It's the only choice I have. And he did my show, and he's like, but I need to stay in the fight because I know there's still a lot to fight for. So my fight is now shifting, and I'm going to do it politically. But uh, the right people don't look at it as an opportunity to serve themselves. They look at it as, look, this is something our country needs. And I feel like a lot of our government is self-serving at this point. And if you look at what's going on, man, like... I mean, fuck, dude, we're sending how much money to Ukraine every fucking month. Meanwhile, half of our infrastructure shot are fucking. I mean, I was a deputy in Compton and South Central. I can tell you about fucking hoods. We have so many people that are impoverished that don't have opportunity. And it seems like every election cycle, they go around and they promise all of these things to all these people. You know, Joe Biden was promising all these things to the, the black community. And it's like. How about we, instead of fucking promising all these things to these people and that people, how do we just figure out how to fucking literally build America up? I think that needs to be our priority, and I don't think it's their priority. And so if you look at what's been taking place, the, dude, the final fucking straw for me was when American contingency <laughs> was on the FBI's fucking extremist list. And if you looked at that document that leaked, it says... Uh, mostly online presence, fairly low propensity for violence. Even though they had no history. You mean no fucking propensity for violence, you motherfuckers? And the thing that's frustrating about it is, dude, I was a federal agent. I was with the U.S. Marshals for a long time. I worked with a lot of FBI agents regularly. A lot of people in these three-letter agencies are good people. They're fucking people just like us, right? A lot of them are veterans, and that's their next path. But when are people going to step up and start saying, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, who stood up for Mike Glover? Mike Glover's one of your best friends. Yeah. I don't know Mike well, but I know him well enough to know he's a good fucking man. Yeah. And for his name to be attached to an extremist group, we should be fucking outraged about that. Mike Glover gave his whole fucking life for this country. I was going to say, he is he was a part of an That's ex- what I'm saying. extremist group. He was <laughs> yeah. part of the Green Berets. Yes. And then went into uh, three-liter alphabet soup fucking service afterwards. Risked his life for years on end. Yeah. To support the U.S. mission. On the extreme edge of what people are willing to give when it comes from a service perspective. That's what I mean. He he was in an extremist yeah. group. Yeah. And, and fighting that. for our country. Okay. So I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on right now. <laughs> You've had that fucking thing on. And I'm going to tell you. Is it a beret? <laughs> <you have> a tin- <laughs> Dude, my beret from regiment, it was out in my garage and it got chewed up by a rat. So I don't even have my fucking beret anymore. Unfortunate. Um, I think that our fucking... The, the elitists inside of our fucking government. When you say elitist, what do you mean? I don't know yet. Is I mean, do you think Joe Biden is literally making decisions for this country? The dude is demented. I don't think any actual president, though, makes decisions in a bubble. True. There's, there's the mean, president and then there's the people that he surrounds himself with. I don't know anything about uh, dementia or cognitive function from a professional perspective. I do. Because I watched my dad die from it. It was yeah. a 10-year process, right? My, and, my point being, not knowing anything about it, I still have 
real concerns with some of the word salad that comes out of his mouth. For sure. And here's the thing. I lean to the right. I consider myself a conservative. I do not consider myself a Republican because I believe that both parties are compromised now, right? But I can also look at guys like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and be like, they were fucking razor sharp. They were charismatic. They could. They had a command presence. They could stand up at their podium and they could deliver a message and articulate what they want. He can't do any of that stuff. And and to me, that's it's pretty terrifying. It's actually. shocking. Yeah. That why would why would he be the person that they chose to put him in and 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 carry the the Democratic Party? I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. I think there's a hierarchy inside of both parties. I don't, I honestly feel like there's. Uh, like maybe it's an unwritten list, but I I think there's like this ascension. It's like okay, dude, That's, I agree. It's your turn. And so I I feel like when I say the global elites, the people that are pulling the strings, deciding who's going to go where and and what position they're going to hold, because I don't think that the government on its face is what we think or what we think that it is or what it should be. I think there are people that are dictating certain things, and so the government doesn't want men that are resilient, that are tough, that are smart, that are capable. Like, look at everything in society, dude. It is geared towards making, is dumbing us down, making us fat, making us weak, making us stupid, all the way down to, like, the fucking food pyramid. They want you eating fucking high fructose corn syrup and carbohydrates, you know? I mean, have you ever had some? It's fucking <laughs> it's delicious. Fu- it's fucking delicious. <laughs> and it also makes you fucking lethargic, fat, and lazy, right? You know what the problem is with that, though? Is, is it by pe- design, or did it just... It, or either did it way, happen? Either way, I don't know. People choose the easier path. A hundred percent, they do. They will take, the, and, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody. It's, <clears throat> and this is one thing I've talked about it a bunch on the podcast too. Like, there's a fav, famous speech about making your bed in the morning, which actually has nothing to do with making your bed. Even though he was physically like, "Hey, get up in the morning. The first thing you should do is make your bed." What was that his name? McRaven. McRaven. Yeah, yeah. C- a commencement speech. I think it was at Texas, one of the Texas universities. And uh, it's more about doing something disciplined when you first get out of bed to yeah. get that momentum going in the right direction. Like one of the things my fucking <clears throat> I have two teenage sons living with me. One's getting ready to turn nineteen, the other one's seventeen. These motherfuckers will not put the toilet paper on the fucking toilet paper roll. That's a problem. They put it vertically. They will have a completely empty roll of toilet paper that stays there, I think, forever. And they just put it, the other one, they just set it right on top. And it shouldn't drive me crazy, but it fucking drives me no, crazy. No, it should drive you crazy. Because how you do something is how you do everything. <laughs> That's you know my what I'm point. saying? That's the truth. I'm like, God fucking damn it. Like, just, I get, but it's, it's a perfect example of there's an easy choice and a harder yeah. choice. And in that one... Both are easy. To take it back to first form, um, the whole 75 hard thing with Andy Frisella, when I went down there, their headquarters has 500 employees. It's a massive operation, right? And they're expanding as we speak. And he says, how big do you think the janitorial staff would be for 500 employees? 20? It's fucking zero. They clean up after themselves. Because if your garbage is full, you fucking take the garbage out to the dumpster. If you dribble piss on the urinal, go get a paper towel and wipe it up. Because we're building a culture of accountability here. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes fucking sense. But any government agency, or the same thing with the military, like when I was a police officer, we had a fucking like 10 Somali women that would just follow everybody around and empty out their trash cans and wipe down their lunch tables. And it's like, dude, it's, it's the American entitlement. It breeds laziness. It, for sure. it breeds laziness, you know, but dude, to go back to the, the Glover thing, I honestly think like the reason that he got targeted, cause what is Mike Glover's overall message? What is he preaching? What preparedness. is he teaching? preparedness? Right. But it's not preparedness just for if the government's coming to get you, Mike, it's like natural disaster. Mike Glover wants to see you do well in the face of adversity. Yep. And what that does, it teaches people to live in a manner where they're not living in a, uh, a state of fear. And dude, preparedness is the antidote to fear. And if you can say, okay, well, if shit goes south, I have this much food and I have, you know, I have this fallback plan. I have comms with these guys, just some basic things, bro. You can, it, it dramatically reduces the anxiety level. 
a lot of people are living in that constant triggered state, cortisol running through their fucking veins 24-7. You turn on CNN or Fox News, and it's just trigger, trigger, yeah. trigger, trigger, it's trigger. It's fear-based. And it's like Mike Glover's approach to life is the opposite of that. We're going to take all of that fear, and we're going to use that as a motivation to prepare ourselves. And as soon as you take the steps to prepare yourself, <sighs> okay, we're, I'm good now. Yeah. You know? I have so many questions about how he ended up. I don't even know what that thing. It was like an internal memo or a list. It's like, okay, did an analyst have to produce a high volume of those? So they're, you know what I mean? Are they grabbing at straw? Like, how did it actually end up there? I would love to know that too. Yeah. Because did it, it go through a filtering process? It, was it a group of people that identified? Like, there's so many questions I had that will never be answered. So I, you know, I only have half of my tinfoil hat on. You're, <laughs> you're a, in a fucking full wetsuit at this point, bro. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think a couple years ago, if we had talked about some of the things that are happening, I would be telling people you're fucking crazy. But I, mean, I don't think anybody's crazy. I just I have so many questions that are unanswered that I, it's hard for me to land. Like government is a good example. People want to bitch about the government. And then if you pull up the actual number of people who are eligible to vote who did vote, like that's a fucking problem too. Yeah. People choosing not to participate but bitching about the outcome. So not only do I think I would actually like to see a nice flush of the toilet of people who are serving in the highest levels of government to reset and then one of the first things is term limits. But on the I other think, side, I the American everybody but the American people that. have to fucking participate. Yeah, but when we do participate and, and this isn't even the fucking stolen election thing. Like, Bernie Sanders was the candidate in 2016. That's who, they, that's who they wanted. And what did they do? Said, nope, we're giving you Hillary Clinton. And it's like, they're no longer giving people options. They're just kind of force-feeding what they want. That's know? where the flush of the toilet, I think, would help. Yeah. But also, you know, when the voting turnout is 40%, it's like, fuck you guys. We need to have a voting turnout of 80 90%. Make it a national holiday. Or... What I would like to do is punish people for not voting. <laughs> <laughs> well, bro, I mean, here's the other side. You ever watch those videos where people will like randomly go around big cities and be like, oh, I know where you're going. Hey, can you tell me who the the current sitting president is? Or can you tell me what the largest river in America is? Or, or can you tell me like the three branches of government? Just these questions that you learn in eighth grade. Nobody fucking knows anything. Well, and it's crazy. Dude. Let's take into account the editing process. Of course, yeah, yeah. They're <laughs> they're they're for sure giving us yes. the fucking. They're it, cherry picking what I like to call dum dums. Some of the shit that that you see is shocking. There was one of those I happened to be watching the other day, and the question was, "How many days are there in a year?" Yeah, yeah, I saw four hundred. Someone said four hundred, and right? another woman said one thousand. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> 1,000. Have you ever had a Christmas? Yeah. Was it 1,000 <laughs> yeah. days ago? Yeah. What yeah. the fuck? <laughs> hey, something that's not popular to say, we are not all the same, dude. No, we're not all there the same. There are some fucking people. Well, you talked about it with jiu-jitsu in the black belt realm. Let's just talk about it as a species. Yeah. There's a fucking bell curve, and you know they, maybe the heavier side of the bell curve is, is a little heavier You know, for some people. And, and, and another thing that I think about, it's like, you know, you are the average of who you surround yourself with, right? 100%. And so because my video went viral and my jiu-jitsu academy blew up, a lot of people that were drawn to that academy kind of share my perspectives, right? And I'm not saying that we should isolate ourselves and be around the same people, but inevitably the activities, the way you carry yourself, who you are as a human being, the, the circle you build is a lot of times it's often like-minded people. And then also I defied the COVID lockdowns. We were told you have to shut your gym down. Well, I did for two months because I didn't understand what was happening just like nobody did. Yeah. But after two months I said, my, my people need jujitsu. And if you don't fucking like that, I, I mean, I, I made a video. I said, if you don't fucking like that, come here and try and arrest me and, and find out what that looks like because my body armor and my AR-15 are here. You're you're probably on so many federal lists. Bro, I know I'm on all of them, right? <laughs> but that's the truth, bro. I mean, you think you send me to fucking Ramadi to to fight men to the death and now you're telling me you're going to take my business away that I feed my children with? We have a fucking problem. Well, and now you look did you see the most recent CDC uh guidelines when it comes to COVID? <laughs> yes. I mean, it's well, it, and I can't fault I mean, 
<laughs> the the death rate they were throwing around when nobody knew what the fuck was going on was pretty. It's like okay, bro. There's a lot of propaganda. You know, like did you listen to? Well, from, what I'm saying is in the beginning, and then maybe like. Like, we don't know what the fuck this is, so we're going to be 100%. hot and heavy. Yeah. But as that shit titrates out, you know what I mean? And I also, I think one of the best things that the government could do would be to actually stand up in front of a microphone on camera and be like, My bad. We did the best that we could. That could only go so far because I do think that there, I mean, your, your head's going to explode when you read the real Anthony Fauci, which is going to come with a new set of sunglasses. I'll get you, I'll upgrade you to fuck the yeah. cleared hot model. And, uh, at some point, it's like, holy shit, the dollar signs and zeros associated with this. And again, I I know that the book was written from a certain perspective that I'm not all the way through it, but some things are almost impossible to deny. If somebody would stand up and be like, we actually, we did the best we could. We fucked this up. Yep. I That would be the first step towards recovering, I think, a lot of faith and integrity from people. Bro, you It'll know never what's, happen, though. You know what's going to, yeah, politicians, all of them. Are, are, it's like they're devoid of humility. Like, do you know what that would do for their leadership capital? They don't even fucking know what leadership capital is because they're not fucking leaders. If you stand up in front of your men and you say, hey guys, I thought that this was the best way to execute this at the time, but in hindsight, I realize I fucked up here and I fucked up here, and this is what I'm gonna do to fix it, and please accept my apology, your men are gonna be like, okay, roger that. No one ever does that. They are still fucking like defending everything to the point where we know it's lies. Well, that's the thing. They take it so far. Like if you, if you're standing out in the fucking rain telling me, and I can see the rain and I'm also in the rain too, and I can feel it and I can touch it. And you're telling me that it's sunny out. Like. At some point, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, what talking? are you fucking talking about? But you refuse to deviate from your stance. At some point, people are just going to back away, and then they stop listening to anything that you have to say, and that's a problem. And I think a lot of people are <laughs> arriving at that point. Yeah. Like, I listened to the—I had that ro the road trip out here yesterday, and I listened to the newest Rogan with Aaron Rodgers. Have you listened to I that have episode? not. Bro. That fucker's tall. He's tall as fuck. Also, Joe's not. <laughs> so that picture could skew it a little bit. But the, uh, I mean, you listen to what he was subjected to because he didn't want to get vaccinated. It's like he's a fucking leper, you know? And now he, it, it, they still haven't come out and been like, oh, our bad. And the NFL treated him like a fucking second class citizen. He tells the whole story. And it's like, man, people need to fucking start coming forward and just admitting fault. That would go so fucking far. But I mean, the whole point we even went down this rabbit hole is because when I defied the COVID lockdowns, my fucking gym blew up because people needed that. Outlet. People needed that outlet. You take people's fucking fitness away. And, and the cool thing about it is because we were the only show in town that said, fuck the lockdowns, man, we got a lot of people trying jujitsu, a lot of kids trying jujitsu because there was no other outlet. But the other side of that is because they are people that are willing to defy the lockdown that circle of people that tribe that i built a lot of like-minded people and then you start to think okay this is a representation of america people chasing their fitness people that are building community people that fucking like want to commit to something bigger than themselves and then you go to the mall then you go to walmart <laughs> <laughs> that's right dude and it's like or you go to the airport yeah and it's like oh yeah, yeah that's this is what america is I'm out of fucking touch with reality, you know? I wish people could feel how it how it fucking changes you to seek and thrive in adversity. I know. <clears throat> Again, back to jiu-jitsu. What happens on the mat and the impact it can have off of the mat is is unbelievable. But you're – I mean, let's, <laughs> when you're getting smashed, it's not fucking awesome. All you want to do is just be like, I'm going to figure out a way to get on top and fucking pay you back. And bro, there's, there's to this day, but you're seeking it. There's sometimes that I, I still get that anxious response. If I have some big, tough black belt, have neon belly and like fucking, you feel your gut starting to get squished. Well, you should just get out. It's like, <laughs> yeah. fuck, fuck. And it's like, bro, you're fine. You're training. That's your friend on top of you. Fucking pull it together and do it to him. And, and yeah, figure out, yeah, <laughs> figure out how to solve the problem. Right. That mindset though, the recognition of maybe losing grasp of your emotions a little bit, being able to rein it back yeah. in, be objective while in an environment that most people would, 
for first off, for anybody who's never been on Neon Belly, where they really slide that fucker right up underneath your <laughs> yeah. sternum, you know, like I don't know if I'm going to throw up or shit my pants, or option C, both at the same time, and I also <laughs> yeah. can't breathe. And you can work your way through that and figure out a way to escape without exposing an arm or giving them your back, both of which are my favorite tactics to get out of that. It's just like, don't you want this? Yeah. Get off my fucking stomach. <laughs> then you go outside and somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're like, whatever. Uh-huh. No, or, it's... you know, it's it, whatever other emergency or non-emergency that can become an emergency in somebody's life if they don't seek adversity, like it's just a, such a huge difference. It rounds the edges for me. On so many things. It's, and it's fucking fun. And it, it's healthy, physically healthy, emotionally healthy, mentally healthy. And you have to be willing to like, I, I honestly feel like to be a balanced human being, you ha- mind, body, and spirit is a real, it's, it's a, a three-tiered approach, right? And if you don't nurture all three of those, it's like a three-legged stool. You kick one leg out and it's going to topple over. And so like, if you just completely neglect your body, and you're not training, you're not eating healthy foods, you're not, and I don't even necessarily say jujitsu, but find something to challenge your body and make it healthy and make yeah. it work. If you're unwilling to do that, I don't think you'll ever be able to find yourself as a complete balanced human being, you know? And it, I mean, none of us will probably ever find ourselves to be complete b- complete and balanced, but it's the path trying to get there, that it's the journey that counts, right? Yeah. And not not being on that journey, fuck man people are people are missing out and like i see even even people in my family that it's like they're super overweight oh you're you just overdo it you're an extremist you're always at the gym and you're gonna your body's gonna wear out when you're 50 and it's like is it though no look at i mean look at guys now we're starting to see i mean we're in our 40s but we're starting to see like guys like rogan guys like cam haynes guys like jocko jocko's in his 50s now right 62 <laughs> 75 yeah i have no idea how old he is no but the truth but. is like that's a myth you're not gonna wear your body out sure you might fucking wear your knees out or whatever or like but that's also because yeah but life this is one a quote somebody sent to me recently and i love it life is meant to be spent not saved exactly hundred percent dude. And so like, like I'll, I'm willing to go. <clears throat> my theory on life is you get a lap around the track to use a race car analogy. And my goal is to have a fucking jalopy. Fuck yeah. Barely making yep. it across. There's no windows in that Smoking shit. And yeah. Fucking... The, the base blew out the fucking windows and it's like, it's very dinged up cause the I hit all way, sorts bro. of shit. <laughs> but then the other side, like, you know, I was my, I got so bad with uh fucking knee pain a couple years ago. I could barely walk. And really? It, yeah, dude. Jiu-jitsu it, injury? No, it was from running. And I That's went, why you do jiu-jitsu, <laughs> so you don't have to run. So, dude, I went to, uh, I had an MRI done, and I went to an orthopedic surgeon, and he's like, you're looking at a full knee replacement in your left knee. And I was 38 at the time. And I said, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think replacing a knee at 38 is going to serve me well when I'm 60. So I'm just going to suck it up, and I'm just going to fucking eat this pain as long as I can. And it was bad, man. And I know like how tough of a human being I am when I need to be. And it was fucking testing my will. And so again, put on the tinfoil hat, right? I went down the fucking, the woo woo fucking methods of healing. Magnets and shit. Did you have crystals? Crystals. Fuck yeah. Bro, listen, crystals, fucking red light therapy, (laughs) CBD oils, cannabis, so uh-huh. all of those are fine. Let's talk about these crystals for a second. I were you like rubbing them on your body? What? How fucking crazy were you getting? Bro, this is Shun Guide on my arm right now, and it's supposed to help have a, a healing energy to it. What is wrong with Bro, you? Bro, listen to me. <laughs> I'm one. I had fucking doctors <laughs> telling Michael's me. Michael's just over here like, oh my God. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> all you motherfuckers think I'm crazy. I, I told the orthopedic surgeon that I'm not having my knee replaced, and I am at 100% now. And I do not need any fucking anything. And I can fucking run, I can ruck, I can fight, and I have zero knee pain now. Well, you need crystals. So what? what is it? I also did tons of cold therapy. Yeah. I got the ice bath, I got or the ice barrel and the cold plunge tub. I got a big fucking uh, barrel sauna in my backyard. How does like, that barrel stay cold? That the It cold? doesn't. So you have to put ice you in it? You have to put everything? ice in it. So this is what I tell people about the, and I mean- and I love the company. They fucking sent me one for free. Yeah. And I like it, right? Because I've always had that question. But like, this is the truth cold? about it. The only reason that I really like the ice barrel is because I live in Seattle where it's cold most of the year. So when I go out in my tub 
in the winter, I have to hit it with a hammer and break the ice out of the top of it. Okay. And naturally it's cold. But if you live in Hawaii, the ice barrel is probably not a good option. 70 degrees. Yeah, exactly. It's going to feel like you're getting in a bathtub. So the other one you got though. is called the cold plunge. Okay. And it has a, a refrigeration unit and a filter in okay. it that keeps the water at 39 degrees. So that thing's game time all the time. All the time. Yep. And so I did every single thing that I could find towards healing. Also like meditation and fucking setting intentions and uh, manifesting my healing and all of this shit. And I know, again, if you would have told me two years ago that you're going to meditate to manifest healing energy into your knee, I'd say you're out of your, you're fucking out of your mind. But this is what I know. I have zero knee pain now. So is it all placebo? Is it simply the mind's ability to affect the physical? I don't know, but I'm going to fucking keep going with it because I turned down the surgery and now I'm healed. So I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. It's going to be a dream catcher. <laughs> it's going to be a yeah. crystal and the real Anthony Fauci. Book. <laughs> hey, I want, I want the fuck. I want you listeners out there to write Andy and be like, Hey, he's fucking right. I use crystals. I healed myself too. Cause there's a lot of people with these crazy stories of healing, dude. Mm -hmm. Do you put it, them up your butt? Is that how they work? <laughs> yeah. No, they have sharp, <laughs> they have sharp edges. I don't think you would, I don't think that'd be a smart play. Buff that shit out. Dude. <laughs> Good God. Dude. But, but, but where do you like, I honestly feel like the older I get, the more open I am to anything and everything. Cause there's the older a, you get, the more you realize you don't know shit. That's what I'm saying, bro. Yeah. And there's a, there is an energy. There's a spirituality. I was a fucking atheist the entire time I was a ranger, the entire time I was deploying. And I knew I was just like, one day I'm going to get shot in the face. And that's the end of Greg Anderson. And I had no beliefs that there was any bigger picture, that there was any connectivity with the universe. None of that stuff. I think that there is now. And what changed that for you? I honestly think just like, I had some different experiences where I felt connected to other people in a manner that was, uh, you know, I'd, I'd get, I'd get text messages from a friend at night when I was feeling down It was like three in the morning and she's like my wife's best friend. She's like, Hey, I don't know what's going on right now, but there's some negative energy around you. And if you need to talk, I'm available. And dude, that happened to me like three or four times because I used to have really bad insomnia too. Do you ever deal with insomnia issues? Just staring at the fucking ceiling all night and then being super tired the next day? So sleep was one I always struggled with. Uh huh. <clears throat> and to go back to Mike, he created a supplement called Wolf 21. It is the best sleep that I've ever gotten. And I it just has saw that the other day. It has completely changed my recovery because I... I never like... Post-traumatic stress is a weird one, right? Like I have a, I think a moderate, my, my theory when I went in for the, the VA, what the fuck do they call it? Rating exams. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to answer all these questions honestly. So they, I think they put a moderate post-traumatic stress. They put the disorder on it, which I actually don't think it's a disorder at all. I think it's a totally common thing a natural reaction to exposure to the things that we were exposed to. And then you can go one of two ways with that. You yeah. Know? Yeah, and to me, I would rather focus on the growth that comes from it, post-traumatic growth versus some type of disorder. And people smarter than me can argue about that stuff. But, you know, there's the Hollywood version of post-traumatic stress where you're you, you're fucking living out a hallucinogen, halluc, hallucination, hallucination, and but then you're in Walmart and you snap out of it. Yeah, and then on the 4th of July, you're crawling under your bed and crying. And, <clears throat> and so there's that one. Or there's people having night terrors. I And I'm... I'm all three of those things are probably real for some people. I've never experienced a single one of those. Yeah. I have I have for the longest time had a difficult time going to sleep and staying asleep and getting for me if I wake up and my brain does a revolution on a topic, I, I can feel I'm like fuck. It it transitions to a gear where I'm not going to be able to get back to sleep and the biggest thing he there's a variety of products and not to make this an ad for Mike stuff even though I, I buy it every month. That's how much. Shout I, out Mike Glover, Wolf Twenty One. Yeah, for sure. When and they have a spol, uh, they have CBD stuff and spol, full spectrum, and it's like CBN and CBD, and I don't know how all that shit interacts. So make like if you work for an agency and they test, I don't know if you would pop for it. Uh, just do your own research. Yeah. But as soon as I started taking that stuff, I sleep so much better, and I like wake up in the morning. My biggest thing was I would go to sleep. And wake up as tired, if not more tired. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know how that's possible, dude. I was the same way. 
and it was a vicious cycle. Yeah, it's the worst. And uh, <coughs> CBN, which is another cannabinoid. Which, That's what's in the Wolf 21. It's fucking great. Yeah. And it, that, I have that, no idea how that, that shit works. That cannabinoid but... is like specifically geared towards rest, sleep, and recovery. I'll send you a bottle of his stuff. Okay. Like I literally, yeah. we were just at an origin camp with a guy who had just gotten out of the military. I emptied, or uh, Leah emptied half of a bottle and gave it to him because it's the same thing. It's just struggling to get restful sleep. Fuck, it's awesome. But uh, I mean, the whole thing that got us on this topic was I was dealing with some severe insomnia issues. And any time I was having a bad night, like a real bad night, this girl would reach out to me and she's like, hey, I know you're having a bad night. I can feel negative energy. And I was like, what, what the fuck is this? The first time. How does she know I'm happy? Like, maybe she just put a fucking camera in our bedroom and like, <laughs> you know, but no, it happened enough times. And here's the other side of it. I never woke up to a text message that's like, hey, I can feel you having a bad night. No, I didn't, bitch. I slept perfect tonight. It's like there's some way the human beings are connected. And I don't know if it's like a frequency or a fucking like uh, some type of connectivity that goes beyond the realms that we understand. But we are. Like, I don't know. Do you feel that? Do you think that there's a spiritual component to human beings? Man, on this one, what's the term? Agnostic, which is like <laughs> just comfortable, fucking saying, gray comfortable saying, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and bro, that's a, I think that's a healthy perspective. Too. I, I don't know. Yeah. I actually am really, I have known people in my life who are, they are so faithful and they believe so much. That I'm so envious of their ability to do that because I can't fake it. And I used to say that yeah. to the super religious guys on our teams because they're like, when I, you know, I'm fighting for Jesus, and when I get killed, I'm going to heaven. And it's like, man, I wish I felt that. Yeah, when I, I never when had I that get, experience. When I get fucking killed, I feel like I'm going to be eaten by worms. You know. <laughs> I mean, that would happen to probably both parties, but <laughs> yeah, yeah it, I I land in the middle, man. I don't there. I do think that there are plenty of things that happen that have no worldly explanation. Mm -hmm. And I think as a species, we know so little about our yes. actual species, but we like to pretend we know a shit ton. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, man. Like the more that I'm open to saying like, there is a power out there that's bigger than myself and I don't know what it is. And, and my fucking little brain will never be able to comprehend it. But I feel like believing and, and feeling like this energy, bro, my life has changed in trajectory dramatically in the last 24 months. My marriage is the best it's ever been. My business is the best it's ever been. I feel like I'm on this trajectory and uh, I'm not saying like it's necessarily like a destiny or whatever, but man, there's some force in my life that I feel like is bigger than myself and it feels good and I kind of appreciate it. And so I don't know what that is, but I'm just gonna go with it. You know, That's why I'm going down to that uh, an ayahuasca retreat in Costa Rica in April because everybody that does ayahuasca says that it like connects you to your spirituality. And I've known, a, I'm sure you've known a lot of people Quite that have few. done it too, right? And I get the same story from all my friends. Like, bro, it's a powerful tool to connect you to your spirituality. So fuck, let's go see, you know? It's just, I just want to keep an open mind. You'll never hear me say like, oh, it's this or it's that. Because anybody that says that, you're kind of full of shit, you know? Yeah. I only know one person that uh, ayahuasca, that type of treatment didn't work well for uh -huh. everybody else has had resoundingly impactful and powerful experiences yeah in their life and i know the the seal community is big on it like uh they're sending a lot of people down there for sure and i hope it's are you friends do you know johnny satello uh not well but yes okay so, yeah we kind of we grew up together on the west coast he's been out on the east coast for a long time okay i've become yep. friends with johnny over the last yep. couple of years and his his like biggest mission is is taking special operations veterans that are struggling and helping them heal through different avenues but plant medicine's one of them and they're having huge success with it so yeah. there's something to it you know or or like uh seth farewell man he was in a dark place too and he went and did an ibogaine treatment yep and ibogaine i i'll butcher this so i'm not even gonna try it but it's somehow related to ayahuasca but it's not the same they say like one is the feminine energy and one's the masculine energy of the same plant or something. you should do the feminine one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Done. <laughs> but fuck man. He told me, he's like, for the first time in my life, I feel good. And I feel like I have a clear path and I feel like I understand all of these fucking demons that I was battling and I'm able to put it behind me in a fucking week. Did you it know? last for him? Did that fuck, feeling last? Bro, he got killed or he died shortly after. Fuck. That's the fucking sad yeah, that part. That was tragic, man. It's like, 
fuck man my homie was in a dark place and i feel like he's finally out of it and then he gets fucking killed by a botched surgery yeah but fuck that's life dude you know do you get your palms red <laughs> no that's woo woo crazy shit right. i would never do something like that do you go to tarot card reading <laughs> nope no tarot. i'm just trying to take the temperature here you're sending some kinky shit bro i'm just here's the thing i don't know what's real and what's not and i want to keep an open mind <laughs> That's what it is. So if you want to fucking, you want to pull out a deck of cards and give me a fucking reading, I'll listen to you. I'll see what you got. I would make some shit up. God, can yeah. you imagine me as a card reader for people? I bet people would fucking buy it hook, line, and sinker. I think just, I could break them. I think you could fucking convince people that your readings are like authentic. <laughs> they they change their the trajectory of their life dramatically. I mean, I would sell it for sure. They fucking sell their house and get divorced. Here's the crazy thing. A lot of people want to be told what to do most people do they want to be led like fucking lemmings so like all of these different things that people can look to for guidance a lot of people are ready to just jump right in like uh fuck there's a documentary on netflix about a guy that had like 65 wives what yes how do you find the time bro i don't i watched one episode and that's exactly what i told my wife i said this was pretty intriguing but there's no way i'm going to continue the series because as an absolute waste of my fucking time. Yeah. But he had 10,000 people following him. And he said, we all need to move to this piece of land because Christ is coming back. The whole world's going to light on fire. And this little section of planet Earth is going to be where it's the promised land. And that's where the chosen people need to be. And he was fucking little girls. It got dark. Like cult shit always gets dark, right? Yeah. And he got arrested and he's in fucking prison now for pedophilia. And people are still following him and believing his teachings and his, and like people want that. And it's fucking crazy, dude. I hope that he is at his teeth knocked out with somebody, <laughs> yeah. with somebody's dick. I know. Right. Non-consensually. <laughs> I, there are a few segments of humanity that I have zero empathy or less empathy for than pedophiles. Bro, they're, uh, I mean, you want to go down some real dark conspiratorial rabbit holes? Oh, send it. And, and Are bro, you going to put the three piece tinfoil suit on right now? Well, here's the thing about here's the thing about the pedophilia stuff. <laughs> A lot of people are fucking like deep, deep down that rabbit hole. I have no fucking idea. Yeah. You know what I mean? And here, I'm never going to say something that to be. A fact or something that I can I will say like, oh, I believe this is happening. Well, why? Um, I don't know. You know, like, but they say like. The whole thing about how Glycine Maxwell was, or Ghislaine, how the fuck do you say know. her yeah. name? Um, she was convicted for trafficking children to nobody. Like, they've never released all the details on that. And there's some dark shit going on there that we're not being told. I think at the, you know, the little... Well, I don't think I can use a pyramid as an analogy because I feel like that falls into another type of conspiracy theory. That's like some Illuminati shit, probably. And well, bro, you know I'm part of the Illuminati. You are? You've heard that? How did you get recruited? Because there's the number 33 in my Instagram handle. What the fuck does that have to do with the Illuminati? Bro, I, d I have no idea. But also, why is there bro, a 33? Because it's, it's Granderson 33 because... I was 33 years old and my name is Greg Anderson. And I was like, okay, Grander G Anderson, 33. Really good foresight on that. Yeah, exactly. You're not 33 anymore. No, I'm not. I'm 41. <laughs> Bro, there's YouTube videos that are like this motherfucker. He he's hiding an open cover. He has a 33 in his Instagram handle, which means he's part of the Illuminati. And if you look in this shirt or you look in this video, he's wearing a shirt with an Eagle and that Eagle is a sign of this and that, and that, that was actually eye-opening for me because that's the other side of the tinfoil hat shit. It's like, you got some crazy motherfuckers that just completely run with shit, and that's their truth. You know what I mean? They believe all this shit. And, dude, it was a fucking Vruka shirt, and it had, like, a bird on it. And they're like, that's a sign of the yeah, no, cabal bird. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know? Fuck. Um, and, bro, like, I mean, that fucking dude from Alaska that started, like, sending me messages... Do you remember? Because I sent you it. Because he was saying, like, I'm coming for you and Stump and Jocko because you three people are the ones I realize are going to save planet Earth, but you have to listen to me and all this shit. Oh, you did send me these yeah, messages. Yeah, because I remember you said, you're like, oh, I know that motherfucker. <laughs> I've got some. I've, oh, he I've was in some, my pants. 
Patreon group. I've got some messages from that motherfucker. He has a substance abuse problem. Yeah, and it's probably methamphetamine. Uh, it's 100% because we oh, okay. used to do video calls. I'm not a meth expert, but I've seen enough twitching from some people to realize that the little fucking dance moves are part of it. Yeah. Yeah, he... He's down some deep conspiratory... <sighs> Me? He might be he <laughs> might be on the shoot on site list for me. Yeah, yeah, no, fuck that guy. Yeah, but he said because he's like you, Andy Stump, and Jocko have been chosen to be the three men that save the fucking world, and you need to listen to what I'm saying. Hard like, pass. Oh, so you you're absolutely fucking insane. Yeah, and bro, those here's the crazy thing, dude. Those are the people that just show up and fucking shoot people because they have some crazy fucking story that they've built in their mind. Yeah. And, uh, man, I think about that because if you're fucking, I don't care how fucking tough or badass you are. If I'm, if I'm in the middle of a jiu-jitsu class, I'm a sitting duck. Dude. You know what I mean? You know, my best example that I have, and this sucks because it's tragic, but I was talking to a lot of the senior black belts who were from Brazil is Leandro Lowe. Bro. Bro. Yeah. Dedicated his entire life to training and his life was ended by a 10 cent round. And one of the best to ever do it. Yeah. Bro, I woke up to a video texted to me by one of my Brazilian friends that was taken live at the scene of him getting drug out of there with a bullet hole in his head. Yeah. And I, dude, it made me sick to my stomach. I'm like, why did you fucking send me this? Like fucking death and destruction. That's never fucking really bothered me. But at the same time, I have nothing to gain from seeing his dead body yeah. drug out of the concert. And it, and it was just, it just felt heavy because Leandro Lowe, Leandro Lowe wasn't just uh, a high-level jiu-jitsu guy. He was a high-level jiu-jitsu guy that really transcended teams. And for people that don't know what I mean by that, like Check Matt, Gracie Baja, you guys are SBG. Like a lot of teams are kind of like alliance. There's alliance. Like that's their team, right? And there's a lot of loyalty to your team, and your team is important. For whatever reason, Leandro Lowe had the pass to bounce all over the place and train with everybody. Everybody loved him. And he had like super positive energy. And uh, like Boucher, he was one of Boucher's best friends. And he'd come train with the Checkmat guys. And he'd go train with the Autos guys. And he'd go train with Fight Sport, with Cyborg. And all everybody had nothing but good things to say about him. And then he was fucking ended over. Uh, he took the dude down. Did you hear that? So in talking to the guys, and again, I don't want to perpetuate information that may be incorrect, but they were pretty he, pretty heavily tied in, into Brazil still. Apparently they knew each other. Mm -hmm. I guess he was a purple belt. And there was like some peacocking when they first came in. I don't know who started that or what it may be. But that may be the one thing that actually gets the guy off is that he was taken down. It was I guess he did grab a bottle off the table. And, and here's the thing. I look at that situation. I'm like, holy fuck. How many times could that have been me? Doing yeah, something fucking bro, stupid, I, escalating yeah. something. And, it, you know... Violence is, is, violence should be avoided at all costs until it's time for violence. And then you should have overwhelming violence yep. until it's time to fucking leave. But I don't know how many times in my youth, like just the idiocy. And, and that fucking guy dedicated, he, so it was, he, he was 30, he was in his 30s, 33. right? 33. So probably 30 years of training. Yeah. I, I bet you that fucker developed his movement patterns on the mats. Yep. That situation, who knows if it was completely avoidable, it takes the guy down and the guy ends up blasting him right there. He can be the most deadliest high level practitioner and it can all come to an end because that simple tool, you know, trumps all. Like you said, yeah, if you're sitting yeah. in your school teaching and somebody walks in and you don't have access to an equal or greater tool, you're fucked, man. You're fucked, man. It's a good reminder. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously hindsight 2020 and in that situation, who fucking knows how it'll play out in. Brazil, they were kind of wargaming that. Some of the Brazilians were talking about the potential outcomes. And it'll, I guess he was a military policeman. Yeah. So it'll depend on whether or not, A, if he is convicted, but I B. I think he's fucked, man. It depends on if he goes to a military prison or a civilian prison. Yeah. That'll be the difference on uh, his life expectancy. It's kind of weird how, like, certain deaths just impact you. And, and his did, man. Like, I fucking, it made me, like, well up that morning because I was like, Dude, I've dedicated 20 years of my life to jiu-jitsu now. And that dude's been an icon like the whole time. And he was just taken from us. Yeah. And, it, and it, it, there's just a part that hurts. And it's like, and I trained with a ton of the, the, the toughest, highest level guys in the world. And I never even met Leandro Lowe. But because 
he's part of our community, man, it's, it feels heavy. And I also think it feels heavy because that's not what's supposed to happen to jujitsu guys. That's not part of that community. That's part of our old community. You know, and when you'd lose buddies that get blown up by an ID or something, it would be tragic, but it would also, you're also driving down route Irish in Iraq. Like it makes sense. You know, I also, I think it highlights though a blind spot for, and again, only been at this for a few years. I think it's easy to develop a blind spot that because we are with willing training partners in an environment where there are fucking rules and we're actually concerned, like when you and I train, like I'm concerned about your safety. I'm not going to go fucking crazy because a, I don't want to hurt myself and I would feel even worse if I hurt you because I want to keep training. Bro, you literally said during today when we were drilling, Hey, I want to make sure that when we hit this sweep, you land right. So you don't hit your neck. Yeah. <laughs> you I don't, know, like, yeah, of course we're taking care of yeah. each other. But we're playing inside of a rule set yeah, yeah. and both parties are doing that. And it's a real easy blind spot to think that because every day you train with people who are in that same rule set, that anybody outside of the gym would respect that. Yeah. And that's the difference. Nope, for sure. It's, so it's a little bit of an artificial environment. Train hard and carry a fucking gun. Yeah. And, and I've used my jujitsu a couple times as a police officer or one of my favorite videos is when you tackle that guy, <laughs> which I'm yeah. not going to call that jujitsu. That was just no, that's, sprinting, that's and, just sprinting <laughs> and taking a dude down. Uh, a dude tried to break into my house one time. I choked him unconscious and it felt like grabbing a child Yeah, just because he was untrained. Right. But uh, the other side of it is like, there's also people out there that are motherfuckers and something that I wonder about. If I was in like a real world fight in a parking lot and I'm breaking a dude's arm and he's like, tap, 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 tap. Would I let go? I wouldn't. I'm, I, I don't no, think no. you would either. I'm saying I hope I wouldn't oh, I'm here because to, of the I'm here to pattern? break your fucking arm, right? This is real world fight. <laughs> yeah. But I've arm barred people 10,000 times and every time they tap, I immediately let go. And so I'm like, I, in that moment, would the, would the pattern that I've developed be what I execute or would I just snap his fucking arm? Depends on if he does the Henry escape. <laughs> Maybe I'll let go of him and be like, oh, no, no, this is a real fight. Give me that back. Snap. <laughs> I think before you arm barred him, you'd realize that he probably had trained. Because you, you, the instant you lock horns you with feel somebody. It. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd be like, hey, fucker, how yeah. about we just go into the mats and figure this out? We don't need to do this on the gravel because that shit hurts. Like that white belt today. Yeah. He had some shit. <laughs> uh, my theory on that is, is off the mats, there's, there's no tap. I agree with you. That's yeah. that's where my mindset is at. I'm just I'm just I was thinking like because of how the rule set that we've ingrained in our minds. Yeah. Would that throw you for a loop? You have enough real world experience where I think you could isolate the yeah. two. Yeah. And I also don't think you would apply it with the same velocity that you do your normal training no, partner. So you may not. I like. Yeah. Here's we're the, talking hit yeah, bro, thrust. Here's the fucked up thing. Is <laughs> on one hand, we're like, avoid violence at all costs. And we're in our 40s. And yeah. I reflect more on things. And that's not me anymore. But I do want to snap somebody's fucking arm and see what it feels like in real life. <laughs> yeah. But how, I mean, think about how far somebody would have to push you to actually No, of do course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like I had a guy, like I told you, I had a guy trying to break into my house. And it's three in the morning and he's rattling my fucking front door. Is he shit faced? Uh, did I have, have I never told you the story before? No. Oh, bro. First off, when was this? This was, I was a blue belt at the time. <laughs> Forever ago, right? But when I was a blue belt, I was also fighting MMA. So I had a, and I didn't have like a, just a few cage fights just to get a feel for it, you know? And uh, the girl that was living at my house at the time, she's like, Dad, there's somebody at the front door. And I was like, what the fuck, dude? And so. Where were you living? Uh, Lake Stevens, Washington. Okay. Yeah. So I grab my AR and I go around the back and I pie around the garage and bro, I have a fucking surefire on this guy and I fucking blast him with the surefire and he's standing on my front porch. It's a flashlight for people listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? Because I'm not going to shoot a guy on my front porch. Yeah. You know what I mean? I said, what the fuck are you doing in my house? And he turns around and he immediately starts saying, shoot me, motherfucker. I dare you fucking shoot me. And I was like this should look like a flashlight, not a gun to him. How does, how does he know that he yeah. is, you know, he and, should be blind. Yeah, exactly. He, so he starts backing away from the, my front door. Now he's in my lawn and now I move and now I'm on the front porch and the girl that was living with me, her name's Michelle. I said, take my rifle, go inside, call nine one one. Cause he was wearing like tight jeans and a t-shirt and didn't look like he was armed. Could he have had a little knife somewhere? Yeah. So you, that guy's stupid. That was a tactical error. Like, you know, all the hate will come in. Yeah. But, uh, bro, 
four seconds, I fucking sprinted at him, arm dragged him, rear naked choke, and he was unconscious. And it even surprised me because that was the first time I used jujitsu in a real world application. Yeah. And he was unconscious instantly. And I was like, oh, fuck, dude. So I sat him on the ground and put both my hooks in and just sat in an upright position, kept the choke secure, but loosened it so he wouldn't die. And he came too. And he's like, I said, if you want to keep fucking struggling, I'll just keep putting you out. You know, we're waiting for the fucking cops. Cops show up and they take him into custody. And the guy's like, you guys got it fucking wrong. This is my house. He's the fucking one that's assaulting me in my fucking house. And I said, I look at the cop. I said, listen, he's obviously fucking high and sure. drunk. I fucking live here. This is, I, I mean, the fucking call from 911 came from here. Maybe go show him the water yeah, bill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he goes, look at my fucking ID, right? Pulls his ID out. My address is on it. And the cop goes, oh, well, then explain this. Because now the cop thinks he's in some fucking. Now we got a weird situation. Yeah, right. Hands. And I look at it and I, mem- and I remember the name. And I said, when I bought this house five years ago, I remember I got a couple pieces of mail with this name on it previous occupant and the cop goes this guy says that he bought this house five years ago and he looks up and goes fuck that's right i rented a room here five years ago i don't live here anymore and i was like that motherfucker just thought he was coming home (laughs) he was so high yeah that he forgot that he didn't live however he ended up trying to fucking get into my front door he rented a room from the previous owner five years ago. And bro, if my front door was unlocked, there's a hundred percent chance that dude's fucking dead now. Well, imagine and if he didn't train too, and you only had one option. Yeah, right. You know? And so, and, and bro, my my MMA coach, uh, Charlie Pearson, who's a fucking legend. I went to practice that night, and I told him, and he's like, the first thing he said, he goes, "I'm so fucking proud of you that you took the guy into custody and you didn't hurt him at all. That's martial artist in you." And I was like. Fuck, man. Because I could have fucking put him in a Muay Thai clinch and caved his fucking face in. For sure. You know? But jujitsu, just like it does at practice, you can go hard but not hurt people. And now, in hindsight, that dude was fucked up and he's an idiot, but he didn't deserve to have his face kicked in for getting drunk. And what I think probably happened is he gave his ID to a cab. Oh, yeah. That's, of course. I mean, that's what I'm guessing happened. Because it's the most likely way. How else did he end up at my house? It, 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 and it was like two forty-five, so like bars close at two in Washington, and it's like he was in peak cognitive. Form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you could tell. Like I'm sure he just fucking gets out of the cabs. Like mm, this fucking looks familiar. Looks about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus. But I mean, and if I had killed that dude, I don't necessarily. I mean, this is gonna sound cool, but I don't think I would have felt bad because. And you walk into my fucking house in the middle of the night because you're so drunk. That's your fucking problem. Well, you and know? you can only make you could look at it in hindsight, and you only get the chance to make decisions based off the information you had in the moment. Exactly. So. Yeah, yeah. But another, I mean, an important takeaway too is they say like locking your car doors and locking your front door prevents the overwhelming majority of yeah. crime. Yeah, because they'll go to the easier Exactly, target. like fucking or putting a, a powerful light out in front of your house or just uh-huh. illuminating. The property, if your neighbor has a totally darked out one, your odds of being skipped over are like astronomically high. Yeah. My fucking property now is like a, a fucking penitentiary, dude. <laughs> it, it, dude, because I don't know how it is in Kalispell. I actually saw some people begging on the side of the road, so you probably have a methamphetamine problem here, too. It, and I think anywhere that is rural has that. It gets a little methy as you get out of the city. Um, but I've had meth heads come to my property and to my gym and fuck shit up a couple times. And so, like vandalism? Yeah, that, I, I parked my boat next to my gym. They should fuck that up. For bro, they did. They tried to take my fuck. They tried to pull my outboards off and broke all the linkage and shit, and it cost me five grand to fix it. But I would like to give them a reward. <sighs> well, bro, I know who he is. I fucking. <laughs> this is how fucked up the fucking the judicial system is, because dude, I was a fucking criminal investigator for ten years. Like, I'm gonna find you. So I went to offer up. Oh, look at this. There's my downriggers. Same fucking colored twine, and there's these things called stop beads. When you're pulling your gear in, it stops the, and I use red stop beads. And I was like, yep, that's mine. Went to his house to buy them, and uh, his fucking (laughs) 70-year-old mom answers the door. I'm like, hey, I'm here to buy some fishing gear. Oh, that's my son. He doesn't, uh, I, I don't know where he's at right now. And I was like, I just said straight up, I'm like, 
actually, I just want to know how long your son's been addicted to methamphetamine. And she's like, I don't feel like talking to a stranger about my son's addiction problems. And I was like, boom, call the sheriff's office. Yeah. And dude, they're like, oh, great job. Good investigation. Uh, You got the guy. Never did anything. Because, dude, Western Washington is plagued with fucking petty thefts right now. And they just don't have the resources to fucking prosecute stuff anymore. So, Have you kept in contact with any of the guys on your old... uh what did you guys go? Municipality? Not really. I was just I mean, curious how, what, I have a how couple things friends, have gone for them. I have a couple friends that are that, that I did I have stayed in touch with. Um, how was the it how was the culture for them? Fucking bad for about I mean, I got out of the perfect time. Yeah. The culture went to shit for about two years. But I would say things are starting to turn around a little bit. Morale, That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Morale is is the profession was so fucking hated for so long. And, uh, I mean, just all the fucking propaganda about how worthless police officers on are and, uh, man, people bought into that. And, and I tell people all the time, are there shitty cops? Yes. And good cops need to call shitty cops out. And bro, I mean, I don't know if you saw that video today. Have you seen the, the AD that killed a young black kid? Stop it, bro. I'll show you when we get off the air. It's fucking dark, dude. He pies the corner. He has his pistol out. He pies the corner and goes, sees the guy and goes bang oh like startled response and bro that's why you don't have your finger on the trigger until you're ready to engage because yep. the startled response can cause you to contract your muscles and fucking killed the kid so and this this just happened last night so are we going to be on another cycle of fucking riots and people outraged and bro the, the thing about this one is this one is this one is a fuck up yeah you know sometimes where did it happen i think ohio i might be wrong on that but I'll show you when we get off the air. Fuck. Yeah, bro. But I mean, here's the thing. Cops are also human beings. There's great cops, and then there's absolute shitheads, and there's everything in between. Yeah. But in my experience, the majority of police officers are good-hearted people. That's the truth, you know? But uh, my, my buddies that are still in are saying that it's, it, it's starting to change, but it's not, it's not the culture from the citizens that people are concerned about anymore. It's the command staff. Hmm. Most police officers, and, and here's the thing, I was a police officer and I was a deputy in Seattle and Los Angeles. So very progressive left-leaning cities, right? So if you're a, a cop down in Texas somewhere or like Aaron here, he loves being a cop here, right? But the culture in on the West Coast is the leadership is very aligned with the progressive movement. And if you do something that is somewhat even questionable, it's clearly understood they'll fucking hang you out to dry. And that's a scary place to be professionally. It's going to freeze you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. On any given day, if I make the smallest misstep, I'm going to get fucked. You know? Like, who wants to live in with that kind of uncertainty or that kind of stress? So I know tons of cops that are looking to leave the profession or already have. And then the downside of that is hiring now. The numbers aren't where they need to be. No one wants to be a cop anymore. And so... They're lowering the standards for new recruits. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, exactly. And bro, the, the 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 Washington State requirements to be a police officer, it's like twelve push-ups. Uh, I don't. I'll, I'll have to look them up. But last time I looked them up, I remember it's just like, let's just have nothing, because twelve push-ups is basically nothing. You know what I mean? It's like fifteen something minutes for your mile and a half time. It's just. What's the point? What's the point of a standard at some point, you know? I do like to watch videos of fit people out running fat cops. <laughs> I don't know what that yeah. says about me. No, bro. But clearly I, no. the pace of the pursuing officer is not going to go in their favor. I have a real fucking problem. <laughs> and I, and, and I, I hold, I fucking go hard on fat cops on my show. Because here's the, here's the reality of being a police officer. Is that, sure, guys like you and I have the, the skill set and the capability to defend our own household and defend our own family. I'm in fucking Kalispell right now. Yeah. If my wife or daughter has to call 911, I should have the reasonable expectation that the man or woman that shows up at my house has the capability to defend my family. And sometimes that capability means you need to scale a six foot fence. You need to sprint down the street. You need to run up a flight of stairs. That's part of being a cop, just like it's part of what our old job entailed. The physicality of the job is something that is non-negotiable. But for whatever reason, through unions and through fucking like, you know, lawsuits and 
there's no fitness standard anymore. To get hired as a police officer, you have to take that super fucking low end PT test. But after that, the department can no longer ask you to perform a physical fitness test. It's really? Like, yeah, fuck yeah. Don't you think those officers realize they're at risk though? They have to know. You, you think they have you to think, know, right? Bro, I think a lot of fucking cops <clears throat> live in a world of it's never going to happen to me. I think it's true of a lot of people. And motherfucker, it's going to happen to you. You're on patrol. Patrol is not if, it's when. Period. And it's like and the incident may be large or small, but you need to have the training and you need to have the capability to fucking resolve the situation. Like the Uvalde shooting, bro, you and I could have rolled up there with fucking two by fours. And I'd be like, bro, we have. I, Let's I, not get crazy. We both like guns. I'm saying, of course. <laughs> but I'm saying if all we had, bro, Andy, all I have is this baseball bat and you have a we're two by four. We're still going to go. Well, there's kids being killed. Yeah, we're still going to go. Let's go. It's not even. I mean, I would push you at him, <laughs> yeah, and then make an awesome dynamic move, and then come swinging. And I would it, definitely go to your funeral, though. I would like say some awesome shit. Fuck at your yeah, <laughs> bro. It's and, it, and the thing is, it's not even. It's not even tough guy talk because it's. Here's the reality of it. If I sat at the end of that hallway while I knew I ch- be children being kid. killed, I would have to go out in the woods and eat my Glock. I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror, and feel like I get to continue this journey of life when my actions deprived all of those young people to allow them to have their journey. I mean, bro, there was a fucking dude there that's wife was in that room. Did you yeah. see that? Yeah, he was the one who I think was looking at his yeah. phone. Yeah, and, and he's like, I'm going in. And his buddy's like, don't, no, stop, stop, stop. Would that stop you? And then he stopped. That's what I'm saying. Like, bro, I'm, I would shoot my patrol partners if that's what it took to save my woman. Like, if you think you're stopping me from saving my woman, well, we have a fucking problem then. But it's like the warrior mindset. None of those guys had that. And here's the deal. Like, I'm not saying every person needs to have a warrior mindset. But if you're in the profession of arms and you carry a gun for a living, you better understand that a gunfight is a possibility. They don't fucking issue you a gun and body armor because it's cool. Like... And the profession of arms sometimes includes a two-way gunfight, as you are intimately fucking familiar with, yeah. right? And I, I just don't understand what what possible other outcome they thought was going to happen by sitting at the end of the hallway for 77 minutes. And, bro, I mean, yeah, we're beating a dead horse. Everybody's talked about this topic. Well, the guy I had on yesterday, the podcast, it'll be out the week before this one comes out, so people have already heard it. Because I, I asked, you know, officers – who I have access to, I'm like, well, what do you think? They're resoundingly the same. And I said, what do you think will change with that culture? What do you think they should do? And he said, delete the apartment department and start over because he thought it was a cultural issue. Yeah, I think so too. But I, but here's the other thing: I don't think that that cultural problem is just isolated to that department. I think that cultural problem is infecting the profession as a whole, and it's like the tough aggressive men that like would be guys that come from the special operations community or guys that want to be on the SWAT team. Like that is less and less appealing and they're moving more and more towards just like weak compliant. Yes, men. And again, put the tinfoil hat on, right? Like why would they be doing that? Is it because they want a department of people that are going to do what they're told? I don't, I don't fucking know, but it just makes no sense to hire the weakest members of your society to be your protectors. It should be the only ones that are applying. And that's probably true too, you know, because men and women that have self-respect and that know their worth and that know they have value, they're not going to go into a profession where they get shit on all day. You know what? It's also, you gotta, you can't forget this too. It's easier to talk about what you're going to do in that situation than actually live it. For sure. No, 100%. The fucking Punisher Skull life is easy to talk about. (laughs) Yeah. And when fucking the one-way range becomes a two-way range, the wheat is separated from the chaff. And that's like what I said about like the the experience that I did have in combat for nothing else. It kind of validated me as a man. It made me me know that, okay, where, where the rubber meets the road, I don't live in fear. And I am able to fucking run towards the enemy and actually fucking be courageous when I need to be. And And you can be fearful while doing all of that. That's one of the things I think is the biggest miss when it comes to 
what people look at from our previous careers. Oh, you guys must have been fearless. It's like, no, getting shot at sucks the biggest of dongs. <laughs> yeah. But you still have to do your job. Yeah. So it's more about understanding that, managing that, and do your fucking job. Yeah. Dude, something that I notice is it's like when an ambush is happening or when you're getting shot at, in that moment, I don't feel like I felt much fear just because... You don't have time to. In that moment, it doesn't serve you at all. It's, this is what I have to do to correct the problem. Like what? What battle drill are we going to? Are we breaking contact? Are we taking the fight to him? Like yeah. we we have decisions to make. It's once you get back to base and everything, you set your kit down, and it's like, whew, or you go back fuck. and look at the vehicle that you were in. You're like, oh, the headrest has a fucking PKM yeah, round. Yep, <laughs> that's crazy because that literally <laughs> that literally happened yeah. to one of our level seven armored. Uh, it was a BMW. It zipped through. It fucking hit. We got we got fucking hammered in an ambush in Ramadi, and all the cars got shot to fucking shit. An RPG went under the car in front of me and blew up the gas tank. And unlike Hollywood, all the gas just went whoosh, out on the street, <laughs> dude. And it didn't light on fire. And uh, we had run flats in all the tires though. Yeah. And fr we were at the government center. Have you ever been to Ramadi? Are you familiar with the city at all? I visited occasionally at night. Okay. So we were I did not I'm not super up on the topography. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were based at a little base called Blue Diamond, which was on the edge of the river there on the outskirts of town. Okay. And then we would go downtown for different different operations, but we were coming from the government center, which was like downtown on Route Michigan, and we were coming back and then they had put big jersey barriers across the route. And it's like, well, we're getting funneled now, but what can you do? Right? Like, and bro, like people think that our enemy was stupid. They were not stupid. They developed their TTPs adjusted as ours did. Yeah. And we fucking fuck dude. This is not the, you know, your primary, secondary, tertiary route. Well, we are now being dictated where we're at and we know it's about to get bad. And then we saw a second set of Jersey barriers trying to force another turn. And that's where like f fucking, reverse out and as we reversed out the fucking kill site was set up like 60 meters in front and all the people all the dudes on the rooftop saw that we were reversing out They're like fuck get so it where you can yeah they all tried to get it where they can and they fucking started hammering us dude as we fucking reversed out and the gas tank got blown out of the car in front of me and all the tires got flat but with the run flats and just the fuel in the fuel lines it was able to make it back to base. Yeah, or at least get off the X. Yeah, and it's like, fuck, we were right on the verge of being in one of those, like, uh, was it clear and present danger with all the dudes on the rooftops? Yeah. And at some point, you're going to have to get out of those level you're seven cars. fucked, dude. But what we My got... favorite tactic, though, is seize the low ground and just fight up. It works. <laughs> you, that's yeah, what yeah. you guys would have been exactly. in. Exactly, but <laughs> fucked. So we got back to base, and the limo, where our principal was, that fucking, the, the AIC seat, so the front right, a bullet had went right through where the door, the seam of the door and lot PKM round lodged in the headrest, exactly like you said. Okay. And he cut that out and he, he still has that fucking round because it was two inches behind his head, you know? PKM is my least favorite enemy weapon system to face. It's a <laughs> yeah. belt because, fed because 300 Because it's, ba it's badass. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, you're, you're at 1500. It's fine. <laughs> a few cranks. Gah, gah, gah. It just... I, 300 win mag is my favorite round and that just shoots them automatic did essentially you, did you hear yesterday that the the ar-15's bullet travels five times faster than any other round on planet earth who said who said that your president That's our president <laughs> yeah our pre um again five I, five times as fast so 3600 feet per second where does he get this information Bro, is he being fed or does he just well, you know randomly he's not, you know come he's not up Googling with that, right? And so I'm sure somebody gave him a talking point, but who the fuck wrote that down? Bro, and then he said again, and he's like, and besides, if you want to fight the government, you'll be fighting our F-15. So I was like, dude, don't threaten our own citizens with our own military weapon systems and aircrafts. Like, what are we fucking talking about here? You know? The beauty of that is, well, not the beauty. I don't think the military would ever turn on the civilian populace because it's their friends, family, communities. We are the fucking military. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, it's I don't. It's like okay. First off, 
Immediate. What are we even talking about first off? You know yeah, what I mean? It's, it's fucking ludicrous. Uh, it is. What's your favorite conspiracy theory? What's the one you devote the most time to? Let me, actually, let's go down the list. Okay. Is the earth round or flat? <laughs> Bro, I actually get fucking like irritated with flat earthers. Because <laughs> I have some friends that are all like, Bro, I think the earth is flat. And, but and- what's the end game there? Why would they hide from us the curvature or the flatness of the earth. I can't figure that. Most conspiracy theories benefit somebody somewhere. Who the fuck is winning on the flat earth? Yeah, what's the what's the end goal there? I, I don't understand. I don't know. Ask someone to write in and tell you. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> write in and tell Andy why you think the earth is flat. No, not why you think it's flat. Why who's who's making money off of that? Because most of these fucking conspiracies terminate in somebody making a lot of money okay, so or getting in power. When we were deployed to Iraq and you'd be on the phone with your wife yep, and it was nighttime, was the sun up in America? Yes. Y- yes, it was. Yes. So I mean, like for me, okay. Also, I've navigated enough to like looking at a GPS and I'm yeah. out on fuck out in mountainous terrain all right, this is the fucking, I'm going from this grid point to this grid point, and I follow this path, and now I'm standing on the peak of this mountain. Like, Also, why doesn't anybody have a picture of the edge of the flat earth? Exactly, dude. And enough people have circumnavigated the globe. Oh, bro. Oh, but have Listen, they? listen. But have they? Listen, this is an, I forgot to tell you. This is another thing that they said that I am part of the Illuminati, Because part of my, like, in my 60s, part of my fucking, like, one of my life goals is to buy a sailboat and circle the whole globe. And I said that on a podcast or something. And people were like, he's saying that the, by saying he wants to circle the globe, he's perpetuating the round earth theory. And he's lying because he's, he's, he's a British shill that's been in placed to perpetuate lies and i was like the british manchurian candidate <laughs> yeah i like it me of all fucking people okay aliens oh aliens i would say it's unreasonable to think there's not other life forms out there totally agree but i don't think they're flying down here and then snatching people up i think, I think if, if they flew here they would get the fuck out of here as fast as they could. <laughs> yeah so maybe like, they you did. guys are stupid but then the other side of that is I mean, we do have like military pilots that are like, have you seen those videos? They're like, this fucking thing flew in front of me and took off at a speed that no aircraft that I'm aware of can fly. Yeah. You know, so there's some weird shit going on. Unexplainable for sure. Yeah. Bigfoot's another one. I feel like there's too many game cameras out for Bigfoot to not have been caught. Here's the thing for me. I think that if Bigfoot were to be found, there's nothing strange about it. There's orangutans, there's fucking gorillas, there's great apes all over the planet. Okay, there's one in North America too, or there was at some point. That's why I don't think that when Game people, cams, bro. When people talk about Bigfoot, it doesn't feel like a conspiracy theory. There's lots of large great apes, but okay. I hope I hope Bigfoot's real. Ghosts. Hauntings. Oh, I don't know. I don't rule it out anymore. I don't rule it out. You know, like I said, the older I get, the now more- Now that you're spiritual, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, maybe you should go I do, sit in haunted I, houses. I, and I'll tell you this, though. I, I'll tell you this. I do think that there is positive and negative energy. And let me ask you this: Have you ever walked by someone? And this only happens very rarely. But dude, I was driving my girls to school the other day, and there was a guy standing at a bus stop. That we were at a we were at a traffic light, so I was stopped, and he was standing outside of the car. I wanted to shoot him, and I have no idea why. And I told. I do. I know exactly why. My wife and my kids were in the do- in the car, and I said, "There's something so fucking dark about that person right there. I want to kill him." I don't know if that's energy because your previous occupation taught you to pay attention for sure to yeah. a lot of things that people don't pay attention to. So that's one that I always try to listen to my gut on yeah. because I have <clears throat> it's happened so far at least once, actually in jujitsu. Slapped and bumped, and I immediately, as soon as we locked up, I'm like, there's something, fu-. and it was just the way that the person interacted. Yeah. There's something fucking wrong with this person. Uh, and, and I don't it, want him breathing oxygen anymore. No, and I just, it, and I and I made a comment to Leah at the time about it. And, like, don't fucking roll with that guy. Well, and then come to find out that, that there had already, had already been issues, but that gut feeling, go. that's one that I think more than it, being necessarily energy that's i think a byproduct of our old profession yeah and that's i mean and, and you got to think about it I've, I've ended people's lives based off their body reaction and how they 
postured to me. So I'm always in the back of my mind paying attention to that. And that's one that I try to, I listen to my gut. On Have you one. ever read the book, The Gift of Fear or heard of it? I've heard of it. It was written read by it. Gavin DeBecker and he's like a security specialist. And the whole book, the whole premise of The Gift of Fear is fear is a gift because your intuition lets you know when something's wrong. Yeah. And he interviewed tons of rape victims. And like violent, like snatched you off a running trail. Not like, oh, I got drunk with my ex-boyfriend. Not that I'm taking away from that, right? Yeah. You're going to get crushed. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 100% of the girls that were violent rape victims said something felt off right before I got attacked. So there is some type of... The well, we're just animals. Yeah, the hair yeah. on the back of your neck. Or I mean, did, I'm sure you felt that like before you get ambushed. Yeah, man, there's something in the air. You gets can, quiet. Yeah, you can feel it. Yeah, you also see other people on the streets, like the look in their eyes and shit. There's That's again though, that ties into recognizing yeah. that because we were taught to. Maybe it's a combination of both. Let's leave that one in the unknown. But category. I'm gonna tell you this too. One more, one more little piece on that. When I was a deputy in Los Angeles, we had a cell block in the Roy Ball Federal Building downtown that would have anywhere from 20 to probably 70 inmates a day come through there. When you walk through the cell block. Because most of the people that are being arrested in Los Angeles is like RICO conspiracy, which is all related to gang violence and, and drugs and that and pimps and that kind of shit. But the reality of those guys, a lot of them are cool dudes. You could sit down and have a conversation with gangbangers and they're not that different than us. And that's the truth. Because I've gotten I've had long conversations with them when they're in the back of my car and I'm fucking taking them to jail. But you walk through the cell block and you can see people. What's he fucking doing here? That dude's off. There's yeah. something wrong with that guy. Go pull his file, fucks little kids. Every time. And so, like you said, as a result of that profession, predators, you can fucking, you can spot them. You have a different antenna once you've been, it's, I, you just, we learn to tune it to a different frequency. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, anytime that I have that feeling in my gut, like if I'm ever out with my kids or out with Leah, I just immediately put myself in between that yep. and get the fuck out of yep, there. Yeah, for sure, dude. Yeah. Well, uh, Michael, what other conspiracies are there? We did aliens. We did Bigfoot. We did Flat Earth. There's, I mean, is there? It, well, you, hey, you've you've seen the meme that we're there's now a shortage of conspiracy theorists because or conspiracy theories because in the last twenty four months they've all come true. <laughs> true. One of my favorites is that birds aren't real. They're just. Uh, intelligence gathering platforms that the batteries have to be switched out on sometime. That's what COVID was for, to get everybody inside so they could switch out the batteries on the birds. Is there really a human being that said that? Oh, for, yes. That's a real thing? <laughs> 100% real thing. Okay. So yeah. what's your I need favorite to, I need conspiracy? To, I need to separate from the tinfoil hat community then. <laughs> I just think our government's corrupt. That's the that's yeah. the extent of my... What's your favorite one, though? Oh, fuck, man. Politicians drinking blood, <laughs> fucking <laughs> chanting ceremonies... Bohemian Grove. That's kind of that them drinking blood. Yeah, and, yeah, bro. I don't know, man. I don't fucking they're wor worshiping Moloch and all of these fucking evil entities. Yep. I don't know, man. Alex Jones snuck in there and video footed it. Alex, Alex Jones. Alex is Jones. Out of his fucking mind. Alex Jones also said. Uh, Sandy Hook wasn't real. Talking about the gay, the fucking frogs turning gay. I mean, is there even enough time to talk about the weird shit that Alex Jones <laughs> has said? I yeah. mean, truly, that guy. Is also special and touched. He just got fined a substantial amount of money, right? Forty-five million. For I, think. I didn't even follow that story at all. What did he do? He, uh, and I might be, I might be a little bit over my skis on this one, but essentially, broadly, said that Sandy Hook was a uh, crisis actors, and families of the children that were killed sued him for that. Oh, and then he got fucking. Yeah, he was found guilty. And bro, here's here's something that people need to realize is. Uh, because if you watch the videos, it's like, hey, this is what proves Sandy Hook was a fucking like government conspiracy. Man, it's easy to start getting pulled one way or the other. Same with 9-11. That's what I'm saying. They were, you know, a Shawshank redemptioning in fucking C4 in their pocket for yeah. 18 years. And, and like we've reiterated several times throughout the show, like I don't necessarily put anything out of the realm of possibility. But it's also I've also been pulled one way or the other based on emotions. And you have to be able to recognize that in yourself and be like, okay, I'm fucking I'm buying into it just like everybody else buys into it, but why? You know? Yeah. And uh 
man, if people can piece together things and present it to you in a way that's very convincing. And it's like, all right, now that's fact. That's, that's people's fucking, and perception's reality, right? So if people fucking watch something or hear something and they perceive that as the truth, then that's the hill they're willing to die on. And it's like, fuck, man. Can you get a little slippery? For sure, dude. The fuck else have we, what, what else did we not talk about? I want to show you the coffee shop. I want to see the coffee shop too. What do you want to close with? Um, let me let me look at. I, I I came with a little bit of notes today. I didn't authorize those. Notes. Um, no, you did not. But uh, yeah, I mean, you didn't want to fucking uh, hear about me walking around barefoot this morning, grounding with the earth, feeling the Montana sun. But I can tell you, bro, there's something fucking special about this place. In Montana? Yeah, I know. That's why I live here. But it's like you feel it. You feel it in the air. You feel it from the sun. Like, I don't know what it is, but I have friends that have a house here in Kalispell yeah, now. So right by the, yeah, come uh, up here once water skiing every thing. year or two. And every time I come here, it's like, I think I need to fucking maybe not live here full time because I love Washington State. Take the politics and take the fucking that shit out of it. Washington's one of the most beautiful places in the world. Every time I come here, though, it's like I want Mon- I want more Montana in my life. I don't think I'll ever leave. Yeah, I bet. I, why I might you? go a little bit more like out in the middle of nowhere, you know, bomber style, you know? What I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm not going to make bombs. Well, fuck. Let's close with this then. If uh, if people want to hear more of my conspiracy theories fuck yeah. and they, they like hearing me talk shit Endless on the, endeavor, talk which is shit on the government, shortly though, to, to tin tinfoil hat. hat. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I go hard. I go hard on my podcast. I don't pull any punches. And That's I, so, so shocking. Because it's the fuck. A lot of a lot of media sources want to fucking nerf all the edges and they want to push an agenda and I just try and give authentic shit, you know? And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I'm right, I'm right. And everything in between, you know? But because people feel that energy from me, the platform's grown and people are enjoying it. And I think that that's... Uh, people are moving more and more away from fucking traditional media platforms and they're listening to just normal human beings like us because... We're nothing fucking special. We're just fucking dudes, right? I mean, I'm super normal. I'm not sure about you. <laughs> but like, we're not part of a fucking agenda. We yeah. don't have some fucking ulterior motive. Just sharing real thoughts, real perspectives. And I think that's what people are hungry for these days. I agree. Ready to see the coffee shop? Let's go see Let's the fucking coffee do shop. It.